Did you miss your deadline to renew your Medicaid coverage? You can still send your completed annual review form to Healthy Connections Medicaid. You may be assigned to another health plan, but you can ask to come back to First Choice within 60 days of renewed Medicaid eligibility. It's your family. It's your choice. First Choice is the right choice. Renew and choose us. Visit selecthealthofsc.com slash renew to learn more. New on Curiosity Stream, we've walked with dinosaurs. We've explored our prehistoric planet, and we were always told the same story. Extinction came from the sky. But what if dinosaurs survived? Amazing Dino World 2. Watch it now on Curiosity Stream. With monthly, annual, and bundle plans, find the one that works for you at curiositystream.com. Welcome, friends, it's the Movie Room Podcast. Okay. Podcast, enjoy the show. Zachy and Brian are talking about the movie. It's movie the podcast on the radio. Welcome to a movie film commentary track. My name is Zaki Hassan. I'm here with Brian Hall. Hey, how's it going, Zaki? I'm, I'm doing well. You know, ju- just for the sake of the historical record, we are recording this on November 8th, mm-hmm. 2020. And so it is the day after the presidential election. And uh, we figure, hey, let's take in some uh, post-apocalyptic escapism for this commentary <laughs> track. Uh, it, it's kind of nice to, to just be able to look at the, the horrendous future situation and be like, hey, this is just some good, clean fun. <laughs> I Yeah, yeah, this was some uh, fun escapism, I have to admit. Uh, we, are, we are watching Waterworld for this commentary, and I know I, it, at least, I'm going to say generously, at least half of the audience is like, huh? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, because obviously when this came out, it was sort of much talked about. But I don't know if, you know, like it would be riffed on even on, say, like The Simpsons or it would be some sort of like, you know, trivia question or something. But like now, does anyone show this to their kids or has this lived on in any way? Like, I have absolutely no idea. Well, uh, Brian, as long as Zachy Hassan lives... (laughs) Uh, 90s action movies will always find a ready and willing venue yeah yeah uh now this is this was this was when i suggested this for the for the commentary i think even brian was like what but (laughs) it was truly one of those things where i was like i have not seen this since the 90s uh i yeah. yeah i i only saw this for the first time i would say maybe six years ago or five years ago oh Really? So you didn't even see it when it came out? I don't know. I was just thinking about it right now. I mean, I was always like a movie guy. I saw all the blockbusters and stuff. I don't know how I missed this. But a friend of mine and I, one night, were trying to find something to watch. And we were like, I don't think I've ever seen Waterworld. Both of us. And so we're like, well, let's do it. Uh, so that that's literally the first time I saw it. So yeah, without the whole, through a kid's eyes or anything like that, I just saw it as a grown up who knew it was supposedly this huge flop. Which yeah. apparently it wasn't, by the it, way. It was not. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. So, so a little bit of a backstory before we dive into it. Uh, Waterworld was was infamous at the time yeah. of its release, well leading up to its release because of the exorbitant budget that it racked up, and we'll talk more as as we get yeah. into it about why. But but the stories surrounding the movie were all about the budget, which was at the time the most expensive movie ever made. Yeah. Uh, One hundred seventy five million dollars. Yep. Which, by the way, today, that's like the budget of a Jordan Peele horror movie. That's not, <laughs> It's yeah. just a quaint little indie movie <laughs> starring Lupita Nyong'o. Like, that's right, right. now, you know? But back then, it was a big deal. And so every story was about this. And it was like, oh, my gosh, the budget is just ridiculous. And, yeah. and They called it Fishtar, which I thought was quite clever. Fishtar, and also Kevin's Gate. Yeah, yeah. So 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 slow uh, golf clap for for the the bitchy media really <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's pretty it's pretty good it's pretty good <laughs> uh, and so you ended up with a movie that was fine that's my that's my review of Waterworld 
yeah well obviously we'll get into it but i guess yeah a little sneak preview i had a pretty good time watching this yeah <laughs> it, it's uh it is a spectacle and i think it's for people who enjoy being like man how'd they do that you know or this looks really you know elaborate and expensive and impressive this is an impressive watch I, um, I story agree. is I, the, whatever we'll talk about that but like this is definitely something to behold i mean it's impressive they don't I, make movies like this anymore they, they really that was my first thought i was like man this is this is an artifact yeah of of that era and and yeah the movie ended and the 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 uh, on this rewatch i mean and and my thought was well i'm glad i suggested that so I yeah because that was my thought when i first saw it like a couple of years ago i was like oh well, that wasn't as bad as everyone says it is <laughs> and, and then this time i didn't it felt like homework you know i was watching it because i had to but then when i watched i mean leading up to it but then when i watched it i was like no like no this is fun i this is a fun movie well i think i think we're gonna have a good conversation so i say let, i think let's, so too yeah let's let's take a little break and then uh, we'll get into it we will watch Waterworld. Did you miss your deadline to renew your Medicaid coverage? You can still send your completed annual review form to Healthy Connections Medicaid. You may be assigned to another health plan, but you can ask to come back to First Choice within 60 days of renewed Medicaid eligibility. It's your family. It's your choice. First Choice is the right choice. Renew and choose us. Visit selecthealthofsc.com renew to learn more. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. And we are back and we are watching Waterworld. Now, worth pointing out, there are uh, two, two, two versions of Waterworld. Yeah. There is the, the theatrical cut, which is about two hours and 15 minutes. And there is an extended director's cut, which is three hours long. Uh, now, Br- Brian and I do not like each other enough to talk <laughs> for three hours. So we're going to stick with the theatrical cut. Yeah. Our lawyers negotiated this. Th- this, and is, this is, this is where is we the, landed. The pre-negotiated settlement we arrived at, so it's, it's out of our hands. Yeah. Uh, so so we've got it queued up. Now, there are two Universal logos, mm. and we have it queued up to just before the first Universal logo, which is where the Universal logo is lighting up as the world comes into view. Right? That's the... Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm I'm ready. You, you ready to do this? I'm ready. Okay. So you can of course watch along with us, or you can just listen as we talk through 1995's Waterworld. Here we go. Uh, we will play on three. One, two, three. Play. <clears throat> so this has really been the era of Universal logos for us. We, we're, we've we've staked out the the what we're going to cover. Yeah. Now is this. I mean, this movie is from 1995, right? Correct. Okay, so... Hmm. Because I remember in front of Back to the Future, I thought I read that whatever logo they had ran to 97. And that was the one we just saw. Is that... Is it, was, Back okay. to the Future And then what three. was this? This was the... Because I remember both of these. One I, lighting I, up and one just sort of... Or is this a riff on the old one? I mean, obviously, what we're seeing right now is meant to be, this is like part of the movie, what we're seeing. Yeah, sort of lulling you in. Right. So Universal, it's where, you know, you're spinning the globe and then the Universal letters come over the Earth. But then we see that the ice caps, we push in on the Earth, we realize it isn't the logo, we're starting the film, and the ice caps begin to dissolve and land is covered with water. Uh, Oh, and then what's his name? Is this Fontaine? 
I I was actually just looking that up. Yeah, the the iconic trailer narrator for it, it is it is Hal Douglas. Okay, okay. That well, is. no disrespect to him. I mean, he's equally as iconic. Yeah, it's it's one of those voices that everyone knows. Yeah, <clears throat> so he's narrating here. So so a long time ago. Now now. The the opening sequence here, the the original writer uh, Peter Rader, he has said that this opening scene was what basically got Kevin Costner interested and Kevin Reynolds, the director, uh, as a, in in the script, just as the, a way of introducing the character. Interesting. So the the peeing into the thing. Yes, the peeing thing. So so what we no, see here is a man urinating as one yeah. does. Which, by the way, wait, watch, watch. The camera goes up, pans up to his butt, then pans back down. And I was like, why did we have to go to his butt? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no, it's, it's to show that he is, in fact, peeing. I mean, I got it. <laughs> I, I think they wanted it to be extra clear in order for this, you know, the, the cell here to work. And I would say that uh, Kevin Costner wants this to be extra clear as also before he takes a sip. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, by the way, I'm, I'm watching this yesterday with my boys, and I put it on. I didn't tell them what it was. And so we're watching this scene, and then they see the, my boy CMP, and my, my nine-year-old, at this point, he sees this, my, my, my 11-year-old, and he goes, why, Kevin Costner, why? <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> so he hasn't watched Bear Grylls yet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Remember that was like a whole meme for a while? Uh, yeah, like what awful uh, thing will Bear Grylls eat? Or it was, it was like he's in some sort of mundane situation, you know, like at the DMV, line is long, must drink own piss. <laughs> like that, the answer was always must drink own piss. When in doubt, yeah. So basically, yeah, what we saw was he's urinating to a cup. He is completely, there's no land in sight. He's on this little ramshackle vessel. Pease puts it through some sort of you know, homemade processing thing that he's constructed and turns his pee into water. To drinking water. Now, I was going to say drinkable water, but hopefully drinkable water. Hopefully, right? Now, now here's the thing. As as a way of showing, like, the desperate situation and sort of the, the means that people have contrived to stay alive, I think it works. Fair. Yeah. That said, and this is something my kids point out, they're like, well, we can filter salt water, like, right now. <laughs> and drink it, right? But you know what? Yeah, this guy was never in the Boy Scouts. You know, we got to give him the... I read that this movie's supposed to take place in the year 2500 or something. It's, so maybe it's, he... it's 300 years in the future. Yeah. Oh, I see. So it would be like 23, 24s, something like that. Yeah. Um, I'm sure he would have loved to have known that. Yeah, right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, but this damn. is fun. I this Watching at this point now where he's made that sort of hourglass out of the little whatever those like pebbles or something the beads, and then yeah. the camera isn't cutting i mean we're like kind of following all of this stuff and these devices and rube goldbergy rusty looking sort of contraptions he's built i mean it's you, this is a movie that just looks like a lot of time and care was put into it right i mean That's, they, they I, yeah i totally conceived agree. of this stuff they built this stuff it's i i mean at, at its origination this was meant to be a low budget Mad Max knockoff. Yeah. That was how this all started. And obviously and it ended up very far afield from that. Yeah. Well even before that, right, it was supposed to be a family film. It was gonna be like this kids movie. And <laughs> uh and then uh when the original writer showed it to a producer, he was like, If you turn this into a Mad Max ripoff, we can sell this. And so that's what he did. <laughs> Yeah, it was it, the the story uh, started with a guy named Peter Rader. Who, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, the idea was like something that Roger Corman could do, mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. he comes up. You know, and Roger, for those of you who don't know, Roger Corman is a very famous low budget sort of schlock filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And so Corman's like, "What are you nuts? This thing's going to cost three million dollars. You think we have that kind of money? Like, right? Which is hilarious, given what it ended up as. Um, but of course, it, we, the the, the the core premise where okay mad max is set in the desert how about we do that but set in the water i mm-hmm. mean as as a something that a studio would be interested in makes sense oh absolutely right. and i didn't even remember the mad maxiness of it mm-hmm. until the the smokers show up later and yeah you know all their sort of weirded 
face masks and outfits. And I, I was sort of shocked, like, oh, my gosh, like, this is so obviously a right. ripoff of Mad Max. But then when I was reading up about it further and they're like, oh, yeah, no, that's, that's what we were trying to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I think everything we've established, like in the first sequence here from the beginning up through this action sequence, it actually does a really good job of setting uh, the world up for us. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, you know, the first of all, we, we the opening scene is just us seeing, you know, the Trimare and the, uh, Kevin Costner's ship, all the various contraptions that keep it going. Uh, and then and then this conversation he has with with this dude here and sort of like, you know, we trade on the seas. Nothing's for free. Like it, it establishes mm-hmm. the rules of the world. Yep. And then and then here when we get the smokers, we say, OK, these are the antagonists. And I think uh, very efficient, you know. I yeah I agree and it, it, there's sort of uh, a distrust, so we know that you know this isn't like people aren't. They're sort of loners, right? I mean, yeah, this isn't a place where people sort of rely on the kindness of others. So this whole exchange between them is a little tense, and then you see that he stole his limes, which uh-huh. I was really mad when I saw that. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> right. But then, but then there's this yeah danger teetering at all times. You know that you have to be aware of these smokers. So yeah, I, I agree. Just very efficient. Kevin Reynolds, who directed this, and we we previously uh, did a commentary for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and during that yeah. track, as I recall, you and I were both like, "Man, Kevin Reynolds, how about this guy?" Like we, you know. Uh, yeah, and I thought it again it, watching uh, this. I was like, I'm "This watching guy," this, and I'm like, "How does this guy not work more?" Like he's he hasn't stopped working. Yeah. But it's weird how he's not really talked about. And I was I was consistently impressed with his shot choices. Um, oh man, I mean, yeah, and, and the way that he captures action, yeah, it's it's very impressive, and you feel the scale and scope of all of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's a great director, and I I actually had that thought while I was watching it. And it's just, you know, it's all the strength of your script, really. I mean, if the script had been a little bit more something. See, look at this you know, shot maybe right this movie there would've... where we start in real close on Costner and then it pulls out. Yeah. Oh, there were so many times I thought, oh, if they had a drone, <laughs> they right. would have like probably saved hundreds of thousands of dollars in headaches. But they did it anyway. <laughs> they did it. You know? It's... There's there's a shot later when the, yeah, just, anyway, we'll get to that. But Kevin Costner, what, I mean, this is like, we, we talked before about Robin Hood, even maybe perhaps more than Robin Hood, this arrived during the midst of peak Costner. Mm-hmm. Um, arguably, this, uh, yeah. is what, this is what caused, uh, you know, the opposite and inverse of peak Costner was perhaps... I was moment. just going to ask you about that. So, I mean, uh, you have, what, like, Field of Dreams and Bull Durham and... What else? I, I, so if, that... You know, if, if we were to... To map out where Pete Costner begins and ends, I would say we go from from 1990 with Dances with Wolves to 1995 with Waterworld. Yeah. And then it was just, sadly, I mean, it kind of became, oh, Kevin Costner, like Waterworld, The Postman. Yeah. You know, or or Tin Cup, which I I have not seen, but I don't remember feeling like I had to see it. Yes. It it is good. Whereas if that had come out in, say, yeah, before this, you might have been more likely to... That, r- real quick, actually, just what we saw there, where he basically just leaves that guy to be killed, yes, um, by the smokers. I I like that too as a piece of character texture for the mariner. Agreed. I didn't remember that he was so cold. Right, like he is kind of an asshole, and it is not a typical Kevin Costner character. Hmm. You know, because or because, what you would imagine for a hero. I mean, typically. He would do something to get the guy back, and maybe he would take something from him, whether that means hurting him or whatever. But yeah. he would never not save the cat, so to speak. Right. In some sort of in most blockbusters, but yeah, I was shocked at how cruel he is for a lot of this movie. For it, it's so much so that I think when he he has a slightly more of a face turn, like it it feels a little abrupt, in my opinion. Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, not not so much that it took me out of the movie, but that was my thought. Um, yeah, but 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 Ke- Kevin Costner getting signing on board was really what got this movie made. Mm. Uh, even though Kevin uh, Kevin Reynolds was involved before Kevin Costner. Oh, and uh, the producers went to him, and he actually he signed on 
under the condition that they would not approach Kevin Costner to start. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Because because uh, they they were friends. They worked together on Fandango. So really, Kevin Reynolds gave Costner his start, really, because th- that was like his first big movie. Can you ra- remind me? I saw that, and I do not recall that movie at all, not even the title. Do you know what that is? Yeah, it's about this uh, a service where you can find out movie show times. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's like a it's like kind of a coming of age thing. It's like a, uh, it, like we we talked about it before, right? It was like uh, it was a based on a student film that Kevin Reynolds made. Steven Spielberg saw uh. it, and he kicked in the money to get like the feature version of it made wow man there was an era where spielberg was definitely keeping his eye on up-and-coming filmmakers and brought a lot of people in yeah some for better some for worse right exactly brett ratner wasn't (laughs) (laughs) wasn't wasn't brett ratner one yeah yep yeah but anyway so so they made robin hood together and they had a they famously famously fell out during robin hood right the movie it went on to become a huge hit, so right. so Kevin Reynolds was like, no, no, absolutely not, no, Kevin Costner, and then the <laughs> the pan, the screen flips, you know, oh, I hate being on set with Kevin Costner. It was like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. So they basically like the producer uh, put them in a room together and was like, you guys hash it out, and so they they worked it out, and then they had another falling out during the making of this movie. Yeah. Did you see that quote from Reynolds? Yeah, he said something like, from now on, he should just direct his own movies. That way he can work with his favorite actor and his favorite director. Yeah. <laughs> right? Which is some rare. I know. Because, uh, yeah, I Kevin Reynolds great. quit. Kevin Reynolds quit before the film was finished. Wow. In in terms of Can posts. you imagine? Yeah. I mean, it, it was so many people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and thousands of dollars, for you to walk away from that in the middle of it must have been something. Something. I mean, what? What What could make someone do that? Just abandon all of that? Well, he, so he... so the, Well, photography was done. Oh, oh, I thought you meant during the middle of production. During the middle of, of, of post-production. Post-production? Yeah. I he, see. He did his... Uh, he submitted his director's cut, which was close to three hours. Right. And the studio was like, well, that's not happening, obviously. And Kevin Costner is one of the producers, and he's Kevin effing Costner. Mm-hmm. So he basically recut the movie. And mm. and w- what's interesting to me is that f- for all of these guys' magnificent Bickerson's relationship that they have, <laughs> yeah. they do tend to create good work. And they are both cognizant of that. Because they have since worked together again, right? I saw that on on the the uh, Hatfields and McCoys, which is like them basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should be the you know, honestly the Cosmos, that, you know? I I was aware of that show's existence, but knowing that it involves these two makes me interested. Actually, <laughs> right? <laughs> like you said, they make good stuff together. They tend to, right. So so whatever friggin' uh, you know issues they have. They at least seem to acknowledge that that it's working, whatever, um, whatever it is. And 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 by the way, he you know Kevin Costner now is very, he speaks with fondness about this experience and ma- th- making this movie. Yeah, yeah, I read an oral history, and it seems like everybody, even Jeannie Triplehorn and Dennis Hopper. Yeah, he was like he he was talking about how he thought it was unfairly maligned and thinks it's a fun movie, and yeah. I mean, the the and I remember this because I lived through it. The virtually the entirety of the critiques were, how can they spend this much on a movie, right? Right, this movie right, freaking right. Sucks. And and I've said this to you on the regular show. Unless that money is either coming out of or going into my wallet, I don't care. Right, right. The only question is, do you see it on screen? Yeah. And and in this film, I think Brian, it's undeniable. You, the money oh, yeah. is on screen. Yeah. This actor, by the way, that is Gerard Murphy. He's the judge in Batman Begins. Ah, Remember yeah. That? You know the where Batman has leverage. Yeah, I remember that. And then, uh, 
What's Tina her name? Majorina. Tina, she was Majorina, yeah. She was like nineties movie kid, wasn't she? Yeah, and then I, I think of her of course from Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but then I, I wasn't sure if she was one of those kids that sort of left acting, but absolutely not. <laughs> She's been working constantly quite a bit. I mean she True Blood, Grey's Anatomy, Veronica Mars. Never stopped. All sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Never stopped. Yeah. And and, and Jeannie Triplehorn too. I mean she um uh, uh uh, she was she was uh, what I know her best from uh, recently it was a show called Big Love you ever see that with Bill Paxton right right she was and for me I mean I, I remember her in more from the 90s though, like Basic Instinct and The Firm and oh yeah Mickey Blue that Eyes kind of stuff. Mickey with Blue Eyes yeah Hugh Grant yeah but she yeah same she's never stopped So this movie came out. This was this was the summer of '95, which was which is quite the year for uh, really big blockbusters. I mean, '95 was a very memorable year mm-hmm. because you had you know you had Apollo 13 and Batman Forever and Braveheart and you know I mean it was it was packed. Yeah, and 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 this one this came out at the tail end of that. Yeah. And and I, I believe it was August, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, it was well. It was like July 28th, so so very close to August. So I I think that ended up working in the movie's favor because it it only did okay domestically, but it did very well internationally. Mm-hmm. And so which the, absolutely makes sense. I mean, the if you recommend this movie at all, it's for the visuals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and in fact, I mean, th- this whole sequence. I mean, this atoll that they're on. I mean, this was a a, a set that they built on the water. Mm-hmm. Which Brian, that is insane. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of this stuff you could have done in in a you know, like a like a, a tank, a, a studio tank, and you would have been fine. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, Reynolds went to Spielberg to ask for advice. About shooting on the water, of course, because Spielberg shooting Jaws, and Spielberg was like, "Yeah, my advice is don't, don't do it." Yeah. Well, here's here's the thing about that, right? Because Spielberg has famously said, like, not just to Kevin Reynolds, he says it to anyone who listen. He says it to random people on the street. I wish I had not <laughs> shot Jaws on the water because I was going insane, right? Yeah, and then they're like, "Your your your coffee's ready, Mister Spielberg." Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> He's like, I'll, the, I'll, I'll shout it to the rooftops. <laughs> the the problem is, though, Brian, is that it Jaws success works against that message. I know, right? Right, because of the fact that Jaws turned out so great, mm-hmm. uh, unquestionably one of the greatest movies of all time. So people are like, well, he says this, but look how good it turned out. And I mean, to be fair, I think uh, at least eight times out of ten, you can tell when it's in a tank. Yes. You know, because they have to mock the sky, right? Because otherwise you'd just be seeing studio parking lot. Right. So it's, you just, something feels off. That's, you, it, I, it, it does go a long way. But I read about this. They didn't even have bathrooms that's, built oh near this set. So they had to ferry, you know, actors in clumps. Yep. To go for bathroom breaks, which is just well, what were you thinking? That's like how do you how do you forget that key portion of all this? Yeah, yeah. And it, it what was the other thing I read? It was they used a thousand tons of steel. It was all of the steel available in Hawaii is what they used to build this thing. And it wasn't enough. So they had to ship more steel in from California. You just picture in Hawaii on a construction site, sorry kids, we we don't have enough material for the children's hospital. Oh no, right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what i think that's goes to what you were saying earlier where if we weren't thinking about all that because that was the first joke we go to thinking about what they couldn't do with that steel right you know, on that, in that state but like if we didn't have the sort of uh, hubris of what we're hearing from kevin costner or not even hubris ego i suppose and uh just all the resources and it just seems excessive if we just showed up and watched this, yeah, it probably would paint a different feeling for us. Back then, I mean, now I don't. That's care. the. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, we we talk often about how when we were we were like film geeks when we were kids, mm-hmm. and so we were plugged in. We followed a lot of this stuff, and I'm sure we were reading you, Starlog, Star, which was the right. uh, so so film blog of the before there were film blogs. Totally right. 
and and so you and I already had an awareness of oh this is the like most expensive movie of all time right but right. that 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 was a conversation that transcended the film geek <laughs> like that was in the the just the cultural air you know yeah yeah and and that to me is is what makes it it's kind of interesting it's just how i feel like this is the first time that became part of the like oh they spent so much money on it and it's like well mm-hmm. who cares i mean i mean i mean yes you do care but you don't like we don't care anymore no no i mean i i still am sometimes blown away when i hear the budget of a of a yes. blockbuster these days i'm like oh right that's where we are now i've, for, I've kind of forgotten I still think of like oh 100 million 150 and now I mean it's well 200 or past the the budgets have skyrocketed so high that it, it, we, you lose all perspective I mean I remember when Rambo 3 was the most expensive movie ever made mm. and that was like 80 million right you know and then T2 you know and then this that's and the that. one I remember first being aware of T2 yeah like I, I think right now, uh, the 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 record for most expensive movie has got to be like one of the avatars or something, right? No, it's no, no, I'm be. wrong. Yeah, Sorry, pa- uh, I just looked it up. Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, whatever the what's on Stranger Tides is that the. Now that you say it, I I do remember that, and I think it was in the three hundred. Yep, three hundred seventy six million dollars. Whoa. How, how does a movie almost cost $400 million? That makes no sense to me because. No. The, the, I don't, I don't. I believe it. I'm yeah. just saying that, that you, someone didn't do. Yeah. <laughs> someone should have figured out how to bring that, that cost down. It's, it, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just pulling this up now. Uh, number two is Avengers Endgame, 350 million. Number Which three is sense. Avengers. I mean, you have a million A-list actors in it. And, yeah, that, that makes more sense. Pirates of the Caribbean, man, these movies, these pirates movies are expensive. Wow. Uh, Justice League, by the way, costs three hundred million. So, womp, womp. wow. <laughs> but you know what the thing is? In in uh, ninety five or whatever, these movies weren't making a billion dollars. Right. Right. So That's I mean, you point. sort of consider the inflation. Angle. By the way, the the number six most expensive movie of all time, Solo, a Star Wars story. What? Well, well, they had to shoot <laughs> I that, guess twice. that makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah, which, by the way, so this movie suffered uh, a lot of weather, uh, you know, mishaps, and a hurricane destroyed, or at least severely damaged this huge atoll set, right? So they they had to build it twice. Yep. So that that was a major contributor to that. That's the, the 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 thing. I just kind of going back to what we were saying before, right? On the one hand, you say, well, if you're budget conscious, just shoot it on, uh, shoot it in a tank, shoot it in, you know. Uh, you know, do rear projection. At and least this set, I should say. You know what I mean? For not this, all yeah. of it. You can, yeah, the action you can shoot in the water, but this set, there's just no need for it to be a floating. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, work. this looks, for all intents and purposes, like the Universal Stunt Show. Yeah, I was going to bring that up during the first action set piece. <laughs> That's beautiful, by the way. That's on there. Um, yeah, no, no, I agree. Beautiful shot. But this, they have right here, like, why does this need to be on the water? Just right. these guys walking, yeah. That's, I mean, there are so many uh, shots on the ocean that are absolutely mag- magnificent. When we were yeah. texting about this earlier, I was like, I was like, this is like an exploitation movie that looks like Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> yeah. That's a good, uh, it should be a little soundbite for this film in its favor. <laughs> right? But yeah, I think I'm remind. I watched this yesterday and I'm reminded now of what I was thinking here. I was like, oh, he is Mad Max. Right. <laughs> right. Just kind of wandering in and out of scenarios that he, you know, wants little to do with. And that's, it's, it's interesting because I was thinking about that before we got on because, because to some extent I was appreciating I was appreciating the fact that it does a pretty good job of just like, it tells a story and it's like a one and done. Right. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you say, well, universal had to have hoped that it was going to be more than, more than a one and done. Yeah. 
uh, and then you say, well, are there, is there more story to tell after this? And on one hand, I was like, well, geez, I mean, you kind of did it. Like what, what does more of this look like? Mm hmm. Probably. Just, I like, was more. thinking that during the ending though, right? Where I was a little surprised that he didn't stay and I was like, oh, well you can make a sequel. Yeah. You know, he's has to come back for some reason or more adventure on the water. I mean, this stuff is just like, look, at I mean, it's amazing. The staging of all this, the capturing all of this, thinking that they didn't have drones all these extras, all this machinery. I mean, this is just... So we're looking at the uh, the smokers, the bad guys. This shot was the one yesterday. I was like, wow, cool. It's impressive. Yeah. Some helicopter pulling backwards, capturing like 15 jet skis. There are a lot towards. of those helicopter shots, by the way, that are amazing. Yeah. And you know what I love about that, too, is, you know, we complain about it so much. And this did start in the 90s. This isn't a new thing. But just the quick cutting and the shaky camera and it's so close to the action so you can't actually see what's going on and i'm sure they're trying to capture some sort of visceral feeling for you but it's much more impressive to be like wow like behold the scope of what we're what's actually going on yeah i, I yeah this think, whole sequence yeah i'm oh, sorry good no i i do just to, to the point that you're making i uh, you know as as originally conceived the the movie was going to be sort of more more uh comic booky for lack of like cartoonish you know mm-hmm. And and I think they made a decision to make it a little grittier, uh, and uh, to make it grittier, you know, and feel like it exists in or it could exist in 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 a reality. And yeah, like we just saw that sort of ferry boat sort of thing, and instead of rudders or whatever you call those things, they have these tires, right? Right, and with chains. I mean, it's it's so much work and thought. I mean, it does. It feels like, okay, this is all conceivable, that that thing could work. And, and the, you know, we, we were talking earlier about, oh, like, why not shoot on a tank? And then you look at these exterior shots with these boats on the ocean, and you're yeah. like, well, that's why you shoot on the ocean. Yeah. Because yeah. it looks Well, amazing. this, for sure. Yeah. This looks incredible. And this guy, by the way, yeah, when I saw this, like, pig nose looking guy with the mask, I was like, oh, they're not even trying to not <laughs> have Mad Max illusions. <laughs> like... <laughs> You know what's funny though is is I think if you were to compare with Mad Max, I think it suffers uh, in terms of the villain because I I think the mm. Deacon played by Dennis Hopper and you tell me what you think. I feel like he's too much a Dennis Hopper, and, and yeah, it makes me take the villain less seriously. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I don't mind, but I I didn't mind because I that's a take. But I, I wouldn't have minded if he had been built out a little bit more than he is. Because he just sort of appears like Dennis Hopper shot seven days worth of stuff and they let him hopper it up. And then, yeah. you know, like I think if the villain had had a little bit more to do and was evol- involved in a little bit, few more things. Oh, yeah. I just want to call this out. So yeah. you see these guys on jet skis being pulled by a plane. I feel so many different things. One, I feel like it's just kind of inherently corny. <laughs> like, it, <laughs> And now they're going towards this ramp. On jet skis, and I'm like, well, this just feels like they stunt had a show. stunt show in mind, and they yep. had to make a movie to like right. support it. <laughs> right. <Totally. laughs> on the other hand, that's awesome. I mean, right? it takes some effort, you know. I mean, that looks dangerous. Well, I mean, it tells you something that a quarter century later, this remains the Waterworld stunt show remains one of Universal Studios' most popular attractions. Yeah, which, and I've have you seen it? I have not seen it. Okay, it's it's cool. I mean, it's just, it, it is so perfectly, this movie is so perfectly suited for it, obviously. I mean, I feel like we're watching a stunt show at this point. But, like, you know, you got these guys on jet skis going off of ramps and fireball explosions. and But it is funny because they have the Dennis Hopper villain in there, and he's saying all these sorts of key things from this movie. And it just occurs to you that we do I think the, the show wants you to go, oh, I know that guy. You know, that's so the Hopper villain. And then it was like you know, Darth the, Vader or something. Yeah. And then the, the, the theme song kicks in triumphantly when the, the hero wins. And you know they want you to think, dun, 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 dun. Oh. You, you, they want you to have that reaction to the music. But you're like, I don't know this. That's really <laughs> you know? funny. But it's still there. Still there. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, uh, Jean Triplehorn talked about how she saw it with her son who was like 13, I think at the time. And like his friends mm. know the movie only, they only know of it because of the stunt show. Wow. 
Yeah. So it's like it for it would be the equivalent of you know how Pirates of the Caribbean is based on a theme park ride. Mm-hmm. That's that would be like watching this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's like oh yeah, it's the movie. It's it, that that's uh, they got it from that theme park ride. You know. Yep. Yep. For for a generation, absolutely. <laughs> Now, I have to say, this entire action sequence on the Atoll is, first of all, it's really well done, well executed, we've talked about it, but I actually think it it does almost too good a job, because it it's almost mm. more impressive than the third act action sequence. You know, that's so funny. I had a similar feeling, thinking like, oh, that's it for the, the climax. Yeah. However, it's really impressive. Yes, but you're right. I think you're right. The, the, this is so many moving parts. Yeah, there's like so more impressive happening. that. Yeah. Which, by the way, so this guy, I had forgotten. This guy just sort of floats away. I was like, that's random. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and then I'd kind of forgotten that it, like they really need that device at the end. It's he. He's the. It's the plant. You know, you're just waiting. Yeah. You set yep. it up and then. So what this the the stuff that uh, Costner that the Mariner is stuck in like what is that exactly? I don't know. That's gross because they put that dead body in it. Yeah. Earlier, so it's, so it's is it something obviously, that dissolves bodies or something? Yeah, I yeah. I mean, he once he's out of there, he needs to wash his hands. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> oh, by the way, so the guy in the plane, or maybe it's the plane later, but Jack Black. One of the pilots is Jack Black. Yeah, yeah we'll see him. It's um, uh, I, I believe it's later, like when when uh, the plane attacks his his boat. I don't even know that I connected it yesterday. But well, okay, so I just want to point out we're thirty minutes in, and if anyone is thinking of watching this movie, if they're not watching it right now, uh, like I say, like watching this felt a little bit like an assignment, something I had to do to prepare for this. <laughs> but when we got to this sequence, I was like, "Damn, I'm like really enjoying this." <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if you want to be impressed by a movie, I mean, I, I honestly during this action stuff thought this is more impressive than anything in an action movie I've probably seen. I mean, that right recently. there where you see him jump out of the water. Yeah, this is a cool shot. You know, it looks looks good. Where you see him swimming under like like a fish. You know, I don't know how they did it, but it looked good. Now, what's interesting is is the Mariner is is a mutation. He has gills. A muto. Uh, a muto. Right. Yeah, uh, that was that was not in the original script. That was a Kevin Reynolds innovation. Hmm. And and the, the original writer wasn't thrilled about it, but it's kind of like you know you you sort of cede control once once you hand it off. Uh, sure. And and I think from an evolutionary perspective, I'm not sure it even makes sense. I was, <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I don't I don't quite understand it, but and we don't ever see any other. It, right. I mean, at the, at the very bare minimum, you it would take substantially more than three hundred years for something like that to happen. Right, right. Uh, but then again, th- just to be very clear, the entire premise that this movie is built on is shaky at best, which is the idea that there is enough water in the polar <laughs> ice caps to make, uh, like, I mean, uh, you know, not not even to the point where like the buildings are peeking up over the water. I mean, this is like you have to deep dive. Yeah. To see Sky through. It's like, well, there isn't enough anything to make that work. <laughs> right. But you know what? When you like say it to me, I'm like, all right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I can just I can roll with it. <laughs> that is I mean, it's like that's like the buy that you have to make. Yeah. There there is a the at the very end of the film they end up on on, you know, the only dry land on the planet and what, what the deleted scenes shows that that is actually supposed to be Mount Everest. Right. Right. Which and that's, I, th- that's clever. It is clever, the but tallest, that is totally one of those yeah. things where you start doing the math a little bit and you're like, yeah, <laughs> yes. <makes> yeah. <laughs> no, well that, and that the landscape looks nothing like Mount Everest. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we talk all the time. Uh, we're, we're such grumpy grandpas about like practical effects. Right. Yeah. Uh, but seriously, I mean, just this, that was, I was telling my wife yesterday watching, that, I was like, man, it's just everything. There's like a, a, a physicality to everything that we're seeing. Yeah. Watching the, the, the two actors, they just leaped over those gates that were opening that if they didn't, you know, once they open certain amount, they can't make the leap. And I could tell that they weren't green screened in. I mean, I just saw two stunt people do that and that was like, uh, you know, yeah. like, yeah, it's, 
and then and then it pans down and a jet ski runs into the gate and blows up i mean yeah you just you can tell this was expensive and took a lot of work and it's captured in such a way that you can take it all in and appreciate it and there's just something so satisfying about it yeah yeah i'd be like super curious actually do for people who've never seen this to watch it and write in and tell us if they did enjoy it i i think it's it's one of those things where because my, my reaction uh yesterday was this, was basically on par with my reaction you know 25 years ago which was oh it was fun you know mm-hmm. i certainly didn't f- come away feeling like i'd i'd unlocked you know the the secret to, to the universe or anything like that mm-hmm. but it it you know you it, you get uh what you put into it which is you know the cost of your ticket or whatever you know <laughs> right and my my kids so i watched it with they were fully engaged and my wife actually this morning was like man i really enjoyed that yesterday so i was like well i'm i was even uh, not dreading but i was like i gotta watch Waterworld again (laughs) you know like 24 hour (laughs) period but i'm kind of enjoying taking it in now it's just a lot to look at being able to watch on mute uh, really offers you uh, again like uh, what i said earlier like you can't say the money's not on screen Mm-hmm. It's it's not like Kevin Costner's salary was 150 million, and then they they used 25 mil to make the rest of it. Mm-hmm. It's like it's all there. Kevin Costner, by the way, I mean, in term uh, we, we mentioned, I mean, he it's hard for people to understand, perhaps now, what a huge star he was during this period. I be- yeah, because I they probably know him best as Superman's dad now, right? You know, so you're like, oh yeah, like he's a good kind of older character actor, and it's like, no, 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 yeah, he was a superstar. <laughs> he really was. Uh, like now, he, you know, he stars on on that TV show, which is quite good, by the way. Wait, uh, wait, which one? McCoy. Uh, Yellowstone, it's called. Oh, okay. Yeah, he he plays like a like this head of like a uh, the, this patriarch of like a ranching family. Okay. You know, so kind of like a modern, darker Dallas type thing, where he's like the head of the family. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And it's like a good role for him, but that's I, my point. Is like that's what you, we tend to think of with Kevin Costner is mm-hmm. these sort of patrician roles. And so, uh, first of all, he was like a global star, and that was why the producers wanted him in this movie. But even then, this was something of a departure for him because he has not done very many just straight ahead action movies. Yeah, yeah. There's always sort of a folksy charm to his character. Even in Robin Hood, he feels yep. like a, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Iowan, yeah, you know, yeah, right. Folksy good guy <laughs> versus you know some sort of British rogue in the woods. I mean, I yeah. mean, even him playing Robin Hood, which we talked about, that was a result of him being such a big star. Now, to, I've never seen The Postman. Is that sort of a? That's also like a dystopian sort of. It is, yeah. Right, it, but that's a strange one, man. I, I it's funny you mention that because I literally just before I, we got on, I I happened to put on the trailer for that, and my wife was like, well, "What do you think of that?" And I was like, "I I can't defend it because I think it's deeply flawed." Mm-hmm. But kind of the same thing where I feel like the negative reputation has gotten so out of hand when it comes to that movie mm-hmm. that it it. Now- yeah, you, you you just have like a movie that's like fine. It's just it is way too long because it's 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 178 minutes. Which mm, is, wow, that's just that's insane. Holy cow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. That now, mo- there's there's no universe where that movie should have been three hours long. But I don't think it's as bad as its reputation. Did Kevin Costner direct that? He directed it. Yeah. Huh. That actually makes it makes me wonder too. Then so he decided, okay, well then I'll just work with myself. Yeah. But then it was also the movie that he couldn't trim down, the one that he made. <laughs> Right, right, and and what we know, I mean, of the movies he's directed, right, Dances with Wolves, uh, A Postman. What's another one he directed? I'm trying to draw him. Oh, Open Range, Open Range, he did. Oh wow, I don't. Where, was that the one we almost saw together? That I remember we were going to go see the, a White Earp or Open Range or something. The day before uh, my wedding, we were going to go see Open yeah, Range. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, we weren't able to, unfortunately. Um. Yeah. But they're both. I mean, they they've they've got a lot of breathing room. Those movies. Yeah, which I I don't always mind. No, you know, but it, I, I it's it's 
tricky, right? Because I think, yeah, it, it, I, I just looked it up on IMDb. Those are the only movies he's directed, those three. Hmm. Open Range is very good. I, I would recommend it. Okay. But it's in terms of its length, it is... Uh, I don't see a runtime. Oh, here it is. Um, two hours and 19 minutes. Okay. So so that's that's practically a, a, a TV movie when it comes to Kevin Costner movie <laughs> runtime. Right. Right. Well, Dances with Wolves. I mean, Dances with Wolves. Is, yeah. I mean, there's a director's yeah, cut but, of that. Right. Right. You know. That, but which I, I love that movie. That's a good movie. It's amazing. I I think I yeah. just visited uh, revisited it uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. And uh, you, you win an Oscar off of your directing debut. Obviously, you're going to be at a point where you're like, well, my shit doesn't stink. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, and and I think there are very few directors who truly deserve to have final edit. Yeah, yeah. Which, which I guess might be a controversial thing to say. I don't know, but well, some people just have those instincts, and some people need to be, you know, pu- pushed. Yeah, and like fight for things, and then it you you then you know if it's worth it, right? I, well, you know, the, it's I, like, it's, it's, I think the screenwriting advice is just as applicable in directing, right? You have to be willing to kill your babies. Exactly. I mean, I, I was actually, without even realizing it, thinking of writing. Yeah. But uh, you, you look at the Netflix movies now where they don't get as much pushback and they're like, filmmaker, make film. Right. And those movies do feel too long, right? And they feel a little more indulgent. And I think discipline isn't always a bad thing. Yeah, and I mean that's kind of interesting to me uh, about this movie because the Kevin Reynolds director's cut is substantially longer. Which, by the way, if I had not watched this movie twice in twenty four hours, I would be tempted to check that out sooner <laughs> rather than later because I, I I clearly am realizing I'm a Kevin Reynolds fan. Yeah, and I I want to know what his take was on this. You know what? I don't know. I would it feel bloated or would it feel like a more realized movie or i don't know it i have not seen it but i i'm like you i'm i'm curious to check it out mm-hmm. uh i don't i don't know you mean a couple the, of years <laughs> yeah exactly right i mean it's it, it, three hours seems like a long time you know yeah by the way see that computer chip around his neck oh how fu- i didn't focus in on that and that kind of funny he made yeah. he found that obviously on sunken land and then made like a necklace out of it that was yeah kind of cool detail i just thought it was like a shell or something but yeah, yeah. oh okay yeah so the, watching yesterday i had to like skip past that part right right we just saw yeah so okay horns. so yeah the the triple horn and the the girl are now on taking passage on costner's ship and he doesn't want them there so she's trying to oh he wanted to throw the girl off right or he wants to he wants to kill he's like i gotta kill one of you yeah, he's like because uh, better we'll never to let survive her die now. And so, Triple Horn's character is like offering her body to him, trying to spare the girl. And yeah, so I mean, are I, your kids like? Eh. Yeah, I, I just <laughs> had to skip past like all of this, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually, I mean, as a as a moment of insight into well, both characters. I mean, it, it's it's inter- in, interesting in that you, the the Mariner is considering it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? He's like, he's not like, uh, just cover up. Like, you know, that would be the, yes. The, Which you think you would have in a mainstream movie, the actor or the, the character do. Yeah. Right. But the fact that he reaches out and he's kind of like, it's, it's going through his mind, you know? Yeah. And I felt, I, I, I felt bad for her. I mean, she obviously doesn't want to do this and she's put in sort of this humiliating situation and, degrading and it's just the movie plays a little bit for comedy here with her trying to cover up and yeah i wonder too by the way just because he's got those gills behind his ears if some of his necklaces and stuff were meant to cover it up so they didn't didn't have to put the appliance on every day possibly although one would presume see here yeah when he drops the thing on her and then he like whacks her with the oar I assume that was meant for last, but I was like, you dick. <laughs> like, well, there's that. Know? And then like later there's the scene where with, with the hair. 
Yeah, that's really brutal. It, it's like like cruel. It's it, it's not even yeah. It's it's really like as a as a character choice. You yeah. can see you can see Kevin Costner. I'm 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 postulating here, but the, I'm sure the, this shot actually real quick. Look at this when we the, it just pulls out. Look at that. Yeah. He, so that is Kevin Costner on the mast. We got this helicopter. We pull out all the way. We see this beautiful water. I mean, it's that's gorgeous. no low budget Mad Max ripoff, you know? No. That is a beautiful shot that we just saw. Yeah. Look, but, they're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and, and I mean, you right. know, like this is something Spielberg talked about, right? Like you're in the water. If even one boat enters the frame, yep, you're screwed because you just got to wait. You couldn't paint it out. Yeah. Now you can paint all that stuff out. That is so the the uh this is like a Terry Gilliam movie or something where we have <laughs> That's really good. Yeah, right? you're right. Uh you, yeah. You, I, I mean the whole sequence, the characters, everything, it's very uh it's it's the it, you know, in a way, Brian, it reminds me of what we talked about with Robin Hood where the stuff with the sheriff felt like Yeah. A different movie. Oh, wow. Good call. Right? I wonder if that was something Reynolds took from that and was like, well, that works. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, too, is that uh, this is so, like, the steampunk guy here. Right. I mean, it's uh, they're not even trying to distance themselves from, like, Mad Max. <laughs> um, but, you know, with, like, the derby and his sort of glasses. Right. And, um, I have so many things I want to say. We'll get back to this. But Joss Whedon did a pass on this. I'm just throwing that out there so we can get back to that. Yeah. But then... Uh, I guess a lot of <laughs> Nuke the Whales, of course, made me think of Nelson Muntz, <laughs> that bumper sticker. But also, I I read that a lot of stuff that was cut was had to do with their all the fuel that they have and why they have so many cigarettes. Which I actually was wondering, like cigarettes is like a character trait for these people, and yeah. I wasn't quite sure what it was supposed to mean or where they even got all of them. And apparently, that is addressed, but they just cut it out. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of. Here he is throwing out cigarettes to people as if it's. See, food this is the thing: the the, the deacon is yeah. meant to be kind of this like a cult leader. Yeah, and and I think I don't I don't think Hopper found like the right frequency uh, to, to convey that. Do you get what I'm saying? I do. Yes. Like like if, if, again using using the Mad Max parallel. Right, you got you got the humongous in the Road Warrior. You got you got Auntie Entity in in the uh, the Man Max Beyond Thunderdome. You got Immortan Joe in Fury Road. Yeah, right. And you believe that there is a sort of a cult of personality surrounding them, whereas this feels like it's Dennis Hopper doing like a a slightly lighter version of the of his speed character. mm Hmm. Or, or like it's it's a uh, Koopa, you know, from Super Mario Brothers. Yeah, yes, right. You're totally right. It is. <laughs> like he's very funny. He's got some really funny lines. Yeah, but I don't. He he doesn't seem intimidating to me. I think that's the. I no, he's a little I, bumbling. Yeah, right. I like that, by the way, where he hurls the match toward all the fuel, and then <laughs> his his pe- guys have to catch it. I mean, I like that. Like that, he's kind of nuts you know that's that's good you're right though i don't believe that he's super intimidating necessarily unless he's pointing a gun at someone he and and apparently i mean his his casting happened fairly late in the process uh they'd Uh, actually offered the role to sam jackson yeah i saw that but he went with uh die hard instead yeah so he obviously made the right choice yeah yeah uh at least in terms of his career and just to be clear, I'm not saying Dennis Hopper is not bad in this movie. I don't think he is. I think he brings that Dennis Hopper energy. Right. I think the film does the character a little bit of a disservice because I think uh, the concept behind the character, I don't really see it on screen, which is the idea that he's kind of a messianic figure to these people. Yeah. Yeah. Even if we uh, we do see him address a crowd later. Yes. But even if we saw what, how everyone views him and what they think about him, and then we see him behind the scenes that he's not that guy at all. He's actually desperate because he's got to keep the facade up. Right. Just somehow 
building that out more would have gone a long way, I think. The idea that he is promising dry land, dry land, and then that's why he needs the girl so so badly. Yeah. So Because they're, you know, he can't keep these people on the hook for too much longer. Right. I, got, I thought this was cute. And she's, like, drawing all over the... <laughs> and he keeps having to erase it. Yeah. This is, like, my daughter and her crayons all over my carpet. <laughs> oh, no, really? Yeah, constantly. So, by the way, speaking of the director's cut, I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, apparently, there was a fan edit that was going around because they showed this. They they built it out on television. That's right. Right? So, they added all this stuff back in. And so, some fan incorporated that footage and whatever was on the DVD or, or whatever and made a version. And then when they put out some sort of ultimate edition, they actually used this guy's fan edit. That's correct. Yeah. Like last year. And went year. back in. Yeah. I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. Right. That, I mean, that's not the director's cut, right? Yeah. So essentially the director's cut is shorter than the ABC TV version, Hmm. which I believe aired over, two nights okay um, i could it could right it could be right two hours each night so so but, yeah they, they essentially arrived at sort of like a middle a middle version but you know i mean it, people obviously probably most famously make all sorts of fan edits for star wars mm-hmm. and you can kind of criticize it for like look man like let the filmmaker tell his story tell his art and so it's just interesting that these the company was like well this guy had a pretty good idea. <laughs> right. Know? Chuck 27, Waterworld 88, ZZZ, you know, like. <laughs> it's it's interesting because that's a very post-internet phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, the ability to do that. You know, I remember when I was in film school, and I'm sure you you did something similar, you would have classes where your assignment is like, here's here's the rushes for this scene. Yes. And cut it together. And then you you make the choices about what to include and what not to. Yep. And, and I had to cut a scene from Saint Elsewhere. Oh, Saint Elsewhere! That's funny. I I did. Yeah. What, uh, what did you have to do? Law and Order. Oh, funny. Law and Order. Yeah. And yeah, I mean it's it's fun because you you really you you see. Uh, I mean it's it's an embarrassment of riches, you know, where you have so many things mm-hmm. to pull from. And and you know, you, as an editor, you can be very creative. Hmm. But that's, I mean, you know, when we talked about Darkman a couple of weeks ago, right? Like, what's so crucial is that the editor really needs to be in sync with what the director is trying to do. Mm-hmm. And yet, sometimes, there's the oppositional force of the studio being like, no, fix that. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't want you to be in sync with what the director's doing, you know? Right, right. <laughs> I thought this was an interesting choice, by the way, what we or pass it now, but where he threw the girl into the water and yeah. just as she's saying, I can't swim. He's sitting in a chair, like checking his nails. Yep. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's not what I expected from the hero of this movie. So the guy, yeah, that's Jack Black right there. Oh, funny. I, I, I love I, that when he hits her on the head, it cracks me up. When she waves at the yeah. pilot. <laughs> He's like, smack. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> My kids are like, that's what you do. <laughs> 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 um, getting ahead of it a little bit but when they shoot the harpoon at the guy and it go, it kills the gunner and yeah. like locks the plane it's so violent and brutal but I was like ah that reminds me of like movies I used to watch like, right? it's kind of gross but it kind of like fits whatever I mean, this is I mean, does, that, I, does that make sense there, I, I know you know, it's a really it, abstract thought there was a very sort of spielberg energy around it yeah yeah i i think i don't even yeah you're totally right like indiana jones those movies are very violent they are you know but there's some sort of i don't know something i don't know there's something to it i i'm I'm having trouble putting words together with it but i i read that there was an article i read that i i it really opened my eyes to it i'd never thought about it but they were saying that spielberg and james cameron have a lot of horror energy in their family films or in their adventure films or sci-fi films. And it's, they don't cro- go over the line, but they do just enough to make you go, Ooh, like really have it land hmm. wow. and make an impact on you. I was like, I, I just never thought of that. 
but it's true. You're right. That is so Spielbergy. It's kind of intense, but it sort of doesn't go too far into being gross. Right. It's this. This is an awesome stunt, by the way. the The whole sequence is actually really well done. Uh, so yeah, the, now you got the harpoon attached to the ship that just hooked itself to this plane, and now it's flying like a tether ball. Yeah, the, circling. The, they've done such a good yeah. job establishing all of the internal and external geography. Yes, you can follow everything that's going on. Yeah, and it looks, as far as I can tell, it looks like they're really doing this. Yep. Right? Like having this plane attached to this boat, circling it, destroying the boat, and also drawing the plane in, out of, you know. And, I mean, you've it's gonna got crash at some of, point. You've got sort of the ticking clock of the plane yes. winding around the sails. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's, well, it's kind of like uh, Empire Strikes Back, right? With yep. the harpoon on the, yeah. the Luke ship. So this is all Jack Black right here. Hmm. And, I mean, uh, he, he kind of jokes about it. He's like, yeah, that's what's going to go on my tombstone. You know, p- pilot from uh, Waterworld, you know. <laughs> but who'd have thought? Well, at this right? point, who, right? Who, who, who'd have thunk w- when this movie came out that that guy would be one of the most recognizable faces in the world? Like, ten years I was just going to say, yeah, you I, like, at this point, they don't play up his Jack Blackiness because I don't know that we had that yet. No. Yeah. This is so fun to look at. That <laughs> shot where he falls into the water. I mean, that's a great shot. Yeah. It looks really dangerous and yeah. impressive. That's the other thing, by the way, is Costner clearly does a ton of his own stunts in this. Yeah, I was shocked at the end when he's on that zip line. Yep. Clearly you see his face. You see his face there? These, and, a and wall of fire behind him. It's and it's an amazing shot. And earlier in the film, you have the thing where it's on the atoll where he cuts the wire and he like you see him fling himself up into the air. Yes, yeah. that's him. Like I, I wound it back. I was like, that is, yeah, that's him doing that. You know. Yeah, because now you can do the digital face replacement. Yep. So this right. right here, where he's so he's cutting off her hair. Yeah. And it's meant to be obviously like an exertion of of uh, you know masculine authority or whatever, but it yeah. it is. Uh, slightly disturbing right yeah i found it uh, unpleasant now now that said yeah i have to be honest and say like the when when we cut to her with the with the the little girl and she's got the short yeah yeah i did kind of bust out laughing so yeah right like i mean that is pretty well look at her face it's so cute (laughs) What's funny is Tina Majorino like looks exactly like that now. Yeah. Oh, With she's so hair. recognizable. Oh, I just meant like her face. I mean, she looks. You you would see her on the street and know this was her. Yeah. Oh, that's so, I didn't so, know that about her hair though. I, I was saying earlier about, about Kevin Costner and and the choices he made with this character. I think I think. This was, at, you know, he was known as, like, the nice guy, guy next door. That was his persona, you know? Yes. Uh, sort of corny, you know? And so I mm-hmm. think he was trying to push back a little bit and, and play a character with some coarser edges. And that allows for, I think, a more sort of, uh, you know, a layered character. And I, I weigh that against, you know, you have somebody like Dwayne Johnson, for example, who, like, he talks about it. He's like, I'm known for playing this kind of like this is what audiences expect from me so i'm going to give them what they expect mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and that that's not a knock on dwayne johnson but i do find it interesting that i think kevin costner felt sort of boxed in mm. by the popular perception of the kind of characters he played so the opportunity to be kind of more of an asshole was appealing yeah i, I understand that you hear that a lot with uh comedians right that's you right know? And they Jim Carrey types and whatnot, and then they they always want to make their dark movie, just kind of push themselves. Yeah, Jim Carrey, Steve Carell. Yeah. Right, and and they, there's always that you bump up against. Well, that's not what audiences want. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I think Jim Carrey really, and this might have been the same year, right? No, it was a couple of years later. A Cable Guy. Yeah, yeah. It was it was close to this, right? It was ninety seven Cable Guy. Okay. And yeah. that was, I mean. Kind of the same thing, right? I'm, I don't, I don't love the cable guy, but he, Jim Carrey, got paid twenty million dollars for it. Yeah. Oh, you're right. In that, 
caught a lot of flack for that. It caught, yeah, pe- people were like, "What the hell, Jim Carrey? Why are you accepting all that money for your right. f- for your services?" <laughs> well, and then it, it turned out to be a movie that should have been almost like an independent film, appreciated by some. <laughs> Yeah, it but was, Jim Carrey was a person for the masses at the time, and yeah, so I it, think a lot of people would have, turned off. Brian, it would have been like Robin Williams getting twenty million for one hour photo. Yes, yes, yes. Right, and uh, it just it the, the movie did not match what was then the Jim Carrey persona. Right. You know. Right. You know this whole scene now with this guy. I. Yesterday, I was thinking, do we even need it? Yeah. And I, and then I realized there's a few things that get accomplished by it, but it goes on for far too long. I totally like it, it for its amount of importance. I'm kind of, I don't know if you could have whittled it or if you. I, I yeah, I mean, obviously that you're trying to convey that it's a dangerous world, especially for women. Mm-hmm. But I feel like the movie has already done that. Yeah. But also, I mean, it's a it's a sort of turn for him a little that's bit, like right. that he's willing to give her that's up right. to this guy. You're like, what the hell's wrong with you? And then he goes down there, but it's just we, it's a long walk, you know. So, I mean, what would you do to to maybe trim the fat a little bit? I would either have kind of. I mean, this guy's doing a really good job. Maybe that's part of it, too. They're sort of impressed with, like, this is how unhinged a lot of people who've been on the water too long are. Hmm. That's interesting. But I probably just would have cut this in half and gotten to the, the meat of it. You know, he wants the woman. And Costner Costner's won't compelled let him. by paper. And then she goes down there, and then he comes and stops it. And, you know, has a, has a moment where we push it on his face and realizes what he's done, and then he goes down there and stops it, and then it becomes violent, and then it's over. But I just, I just, yesterday I was just feeling the length of this for some reason. Yeah, I I agree with you. No, I, I, it's tough because part of me is also like, I mean, this is a PG-13 movie. It's, it's ostensibly a family movie. So when you like make prostitution, like a key element and, and. uh, And it's, and prostitution is, you could also argue that. Like he the, is the prostituting person is choosing her. to do that for in exchange for money. You know what I mean? But this woman is having no say. Yeah. M- in more accurate. The transaction he, here. He is prostituting her. Yes. Uh, like, Oh, here you do this for me. Yeah. Cause I want yeah. this thing. Right. Now I, I, I know I literally just watched this, but does the paper ever pay off? I can't remember. It, it does in a fashion, right? Because he's looking at, yeah, you know what? It does in a, in a way, but, uh, but only obliquely. Right. This actor man, is very, very familiar. Yeah, he's good. He's good. I don't know. Yeah, I just, if I were like doing a polish on this, I would make that paper much more important. Yeah. Because then it's like, why is he willing to go through all of this? I don't know. No, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, the idea obviously is like, well, I, I, in Waterworld, something as simple as paper is like, yeah, uh, you know, more valuable than anything else. Or the, you know, and then it's kind of the Chekhov's gun thing. I'm yeah. stretching for that, but you know, like yeah, if it's no, no, you're going to spend it. so much time on it, it feels like it should have some sort of payoff. So this actor, but this, by the way, this... his name is Kim Coates. Oh, that sounds familiar. Kim Coates, and he's been in like everything. I mean, this is this is this is he's one of those. He's a stereotypical. Hey, that guy. Oh, okay. What what else? Just a, a couple of them. Uh things he's been. He was most recently that I saw him in in uh, Fantasy Island. Oh, really? Yeah. But and I, I that's exactly I remember him from that. Um, but he's in Assault on Precinct Thirteen. He's in Open uh. Range with uh, Kevin Costner. Ah. Uh. He's in Pearl Harbor, Black Hawk Down. Battlefield oh, wow. Earth, okay. Unforgettable and Unstoppable. So he's got the Un franchise covered. <laughs> um, quite a Last Boy Scout. It's a lot of stuff. He's one of those guys. Yeah, he's one of those guys who would be fun on a podcast. Like I was there too. Yeah, right. He's got a million stories. Uh, in some ways, 
this almost reminds me, I'm getting the vibe watching it with the sound off, but with uh, the War of the Worlds with Tom Cruise having to kill Tim Robbins. Oh, yeah. Oh, good call. Yeah. And you just saw that recently, didn't you? War of the Worlds. Yeah. So I mean, cool. that said, Costner created this situation here, unlike in that film. But. Yeah. But I mean, as as a turn for his character, I guess it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Doing what he's got to do to protect his people. That scene is dark, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> War of the Worlds. I mean, I knew I, I remembered it, but when I rewatched it, I was like, wow, Spielberg was really like, yeah, I'm going to do this now. See, I need to rewatch that. Because, in fact, I, I, I've been meaning to ever since you told me you watched it. I was like, I should check it out again. It's, uh, it's, it's good. It's, it's very sketch like. It's like a patchwork of stories kind of knitted together. Yeah. But it's, it's impressive. Like, my, you know, it's, my, it's, it's my better than. My recollection is, is that that scene, the Tim Robbins scene, was where it kind of lost me. That whole, yeah, as soon as they go to that farm, the movie just stops in its tracks. Mm. Um, but you can fight through it and it you, you know carries on but yeah this was this was a good sort of twist here yes i mean obviously you know right <laughs> kevin costner isn't dead but him coming up with the, the the villain coming up with the bloody knife and then turning and real you reveal that he's got a hole in his back right i, I like that yeah so by the way I, I, just a couple other things i had written down that i think we were working against this movie was seeing that uh, apparently even during production here where people might not have been too happy with him was Kevin Costner was staying on an oceanfront villa <laughs> with a chef and a butler. And it cost $4,500 a night. Whereas crew members had to stay in uninsulated condominiums. So I'm sure that, that, you know, hearing stories like that. Oh, and then the other sort of famous one was that Costner had them digitally yes. revise his hairline. I, I heard about that. Yeah. Which by the way, I was sort of, paying attention to that knowing that and i i never noticed it like i don't i, I mean it, i guess digital work was <laughs> ahead of its time back then at least for hair yeah his hair is thin enough that the fact that it's wet all the time sort of draws attention to encroaching baldness see but here it looks pretty it looks thicker yeah. so is this altered or is he wearing some sort of extra thing or i don't know so in in uh Robin Hood, he's got the long hair. Is that is that a piece? I remember being pretty thick in Robin Hood. I wonder if he was maybe wearing something. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, I think it looks fine. Like I, you know. Yeah. So in you know we were talking about digital. Like th- th- this upcoming shot right here is the only time they really uh, meaningfully use CGI in the movie. <laughs> Which really made me jump back in my chair like what the heck was that thing <laughs> yeah it, it suddenly becomes like a hercules the legendary journeys for like a yeah, yes right which by the way i i didn't realize what he was doing but i kind of like it that he's using himself as bait to catch this sea monster yeah that's that's clever see but the the thing with that is suddenly you're like oh there are sea monsters on this world yeah yeah like that, that feels like, and then we just never refer to that concept again. Right, right. Like you talk about Chekhov's gun, that that should be something that you bring into play now. Yeah. Three, right? Yep. Because it's like, okay, well, that's just a thing. Anyway, here, how's your food? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And if they are out on the, the open sea the whole time, I mean, yeah, you'd worry about being, yeah. being capsized by something like that or like obviously okay so this is a world where you've got like mutated fish people so that you know the boundaries right. of the world encompass that but even still you think like oh, what like how does that what, what how how sci-fi is this world mm-hmm you know i would like to learn that those were just children's goldfish <laughs> that once released out of their bowls were allowed to grow to full size. You flush them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's really funny. So, uh, real quick, so I guess let's talk about Joss Whedon. I didn't realize that he uh, he worked seven weeks on this movie, apparently, during production. He was, like, on set, wasn't he? he like, Yeah. Apparently, he was brought in. He was supposed to be on for a week. And then he ended up, he said it was seven weeks of hell. And apparently the hardest part for him 
was there were ideas that Kevin Costner wouldn't budge on. Hmm. So it was him trying to punch up the movie and do whatever he could, but he had to work around these immovable ideas that Costner had. And then, you know, later there's like a lot more puns and stuff. And he even said, he's like, yeah, I was paid to make a bunch of fish puns. And, you know. <laughs> so, but he does it, not speak of it favorably. It, well, well, I think, I think that makes sense that his, his probably biggest impact was on, on the, the, the Dennis Hopper stuff. Hopper. Right. Yeah. Which by the way, and he was a, a script doctor on speed. So he has, <laughs> he's, he's given Hopper a lot of funny lines. Yeah. So th- that, that suddenly you start connecting those dots a little bit right mhm but i thought i thought what what Whedon said was interesting he said i was there basically taking notes from costner who's very nice fine to work with but he's not a writer mm mm-hmm. mhm so i i find it interesting that he's still stepping gingerly like mhm he's not like oh what an that's asshole that guy was you know yeah that's a good point and well maybe maybe that's it i mean maybe he isn't a bad guy right i mean it's, you don't have to be a jerk but you can be passionate right about what you're making and when you have you know filmmaking is a team sport and when everyone's passionate about different ideas that can create friction see and and brian this is interesting to me because because i mentioned before like the character is not you know traditionally likable right Mm -hmm. he is coarse and so you can't be like oh costner only cares about his ego and that's why he's got his fingers in the pie and stuff i mean one presumes he did have a drive towards making it the best movie it could be. Right. Uh, not, notwithstanding, you mentioned like staying at the hotel and things like that. I was thinking about that. I was like, like I can see the crew possibly getting upset about that, but is that something they should be upset about? I know. I mean, I think there's always going to be, you're going to be, you know, whoever's got more than you, in some yeah. sort of work situation, you're always there's going to be a little dissent, right? But at the same time, I mean, yeah, I don't know. When you're a huge star, they give you that stuff. You're, you know, you're, like your okay. agent asks for that. That's stuff. what I'm saying. You're the star of the picture. You're a producer. Yeah, and so you'd think, like, why would he be like, oh yeah, let me sleep like in the barracks with everybody? <laughs> right, I, right. I mean, you know what I mean. I'm just and some some people might though. You know, some actors might because they know it would create camaraderie and. Here's yeah. here's the way I look at it, and I I, I sound like I'm like uh, Kevin Costner's defense attorney. No, 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 no. I get what you're saying, though. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm like, look, all Kevin Costner owes is don't be an asshole when you're on the set. Yep. And and do your do, a, best job. do your work. You know. Yep. And by all accounts, Joss Whedon just said it. He's a nice guy. Right. So I mean that that's it, right? Yeah. No, I I absolutely think you're right. But I can imagine still. I mean, people. it's like if if you're like, uh, you know, one of the crew members, are you going to be like Kevin Costner staying at the Four Seasons? Who do you think you are? You know, like, right, right. <laughs> so is this the turn you were talking about where he's nice all of a sudden? Look at yeah, her face. Like, She's so cute. It, <laughs> it's a great shot. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, I, I haven't mentioned this at all, probably because we're watching it on mute. The music score in this movie is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, James Newton Howard. I, I listen, Brian, I listen to the soundtrack all the time. Oh, wow. I put it on when I write. And, oh. And, you know, I haven't seen the movie itself in forever, so it was crazy to, like, watch it and put put scenes to the music that I just know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it is among his very best scores he's ever done. Yeah, and I mean that's saying something. It really is, you know. Yeah, I, I definitely when I was listening to it, there were sort of musical phrases I recognized. Mm. So I was like, "Oh, I know this guy. Who is right, this?" Right. And then yeah, and then it, James Newton Howard. I mean, he does Shyamalan's movies, which are just fantastic scores. I almost miss it. that he's not doing Shyamalan stuff anymore because he brought out great stuff out of him. Yeah, Sixth Sense and uh, Unbreakable are both amazing. Oh, so Signs, good. Signs also. Signs is so good, yeah. But this right here, obviously him teaching her to swim is going to end up being important. But what is it that prompts that? Was it that picture he was looking at? Oh, well, maybe the paper did pay off. Hmm, okay. Where she, she drew them as a family. Oh, uh, okay. He's like, oh, I've been kind of an asshole. I, you know, yeah. I, I think they could have maybe even gone a step further. In, for his turn, 
Because he's this is a guy who just threw a child off a ship to drown, <laughs> right. you know, like thirty minutes ago. Yeah, but I I get it. I get it. I wonder if that was annoying. Now that I'm looking at Jeannie Triplehorn, where she's like, "Okay, I get to got to be in this boat and wear these rags. This kind of sucks, but you know that's okay." But then they're like, "Well, we're we're going to cut your hair, and now you got to wear an uncomfortable wig for the rest of the movie." She's like, "Are you right. freaking kidding me?" <laughs> Jeannie Triplehorn, by the way, is married to an actor named Leland Orser, who okay. is if it, I you may not recognize his name, I guarantee you Google him, you'll be like, "Oh, that guy." He's another one of those. Hey, that, that, guy. <laughs> that makes me think of like Langan, Langdon Alger. It it is so like that, one of those names, isn't it? Yeah. And I I know I knew he was anyway, but I just happened to you know because of my ER rewatch, he's like a major mm. supporting character for like the last you know five six years of that show. Yeah. And I was like, well, good for him. He married up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, th- I'm reminded. This is uh, when you were asking me if I had watched Waterworld yet. Yesterday, uh-huh. this was the scene I filmed when I sent you that video. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why does this look familiar? Oh, yeah. This is what I, what I videoed for Zeki. <laughs> I thought yeah. this was kind of cool. The underwater periscope thing, and he sees those guys waiting. I mean, this is just so cool production designy right where they're under the hidden under the water but they have these things connected to them these little tubes that are going up so they can breathe and just inventive yeah i also i mean i like the the world of his boat that the trimaran his ship mm-hmm. where it's got all these little gadgets and doodads it's almost like his own little batmobile yeah yeah Oh, by the way, I was, I'm just kind of going through some of the stuff I'd written down that I'd read. But going back to Kevin Costner a little bit in his defense, apparently he personally invested $22 million of his own money into this. In 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 what respect? I don't know. That's I just have that fact, but I wonder if that has to do with taking out of a paycheck, of turning over profits. I don't know, but that's a lot of mo- uh, money to... Can you imagine? That? <laughs> okay, I'm willing to invest $22 million that could be mine for the sake of my art. I mean, and, and it's a nice that's, spot to be in. The the, the thing is, because because like I said, he he speaks about it with uh, you know he he's not it's not like Josh Brolin talking about Jonah Hex or something, you know. Uh, he, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like twenty five years later, he has no reason to be kind to the movie. He's like, no, I you know people like it, and I you know, and and I think the reason for that is because that effort, all, the money, everything. Uh, that went into it i mean it paid off you can see it on the screen Mm -hmm. yeah and we can you can you can critique the movie for being generic or you know predictable or whatever and i think i think there's those are absolutely valid critiques yeah but what you can't say is that this thing got hacked to pieces by the studio and it's just this mutant monster of a thing right you know yeah by the way i I, i'm appreciating this moment on screen here now where he's having them all go to the side of his boat and he's hanging off of it so he can lift it up to avoid a net that they've set for him. Yeah. You know, if you're going to make a movie about boats on water, you got to think of as many ways to creatively take advantage of that. Right. That's true. I was like, that's, that's, that's good. You know, that's the, I mean, unlike Mad Max where you can vary the, the topography. Mm hmm. Yeah. To, you know, like how many things can we do with this boat? You know, like have him lift one side and avoid a thing and lift, yeah, right. run to the other side and lean off of it and lift the other side. Like, like there are four Mad Max films and to their credit, each one of them is visually distinct from each other. Yeah. You know, uh, whereas again, going back to what I was saying earlier, I think, I think that's sort of where you, you get boxed in a little bit with Waterworld as a premise. It's like, all right, well, in the next one, it's still water world. <laughs> yeah, it's still true. water in the world. That's you know? true. So going back, uh, can you tell I'm going through my document looking at facts? No, I like uh, <laughs> but apparently, I think we had made reference that this was known, or is known probably still as a flop, but it did make its money back. Yeah. And uh, I guess took the cost to make it and produce it, pro- I'm sorry, produce it and market it was $235 million, which, I mean, back then, that's 
100 million for Terminator 2 was like, wow. Yeah. Um, but it grossed 264 million. So not a wide margin of profit, but it was a profit. And then, of course, you got home video and all those sorts of things, licensing. So it was profitable. Yeah, it. Uh, that's that's again w- when we talk about the the cultural conversation around flops and hits. I feel like that really became a thing in the '90s. Mm. Because I mean, granted, we we didn't have the the awareness in in the '80s of of that, but the idea of like, oh, this movie costs so much, it sucks, or mm-hmm, this movie mm-hmm. is a flop. It, like it, you know that that informed. Like again, I'm just using my wife as an example. She's like, oh, I thought everybody hated it, and, right? And I was like, well, no. I mean, the reviews are like right down the middle, and it just costs a lot. Who cares? She's like, oh, it was a big flop, wasn't it? I was like, well, no. And I'm like having to explain it. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of curious about that now. I just Googled it because I was wondering. But I guess Variety has been reporting box office since 1922. Hmm. But I don't remember that being... It seemed like you either had to dig for it, maybe in the 80s, or, you know, that was something if you were really into niche sort of (laughs) aspects of entertainment, you would do that. But now it's you know, front headline stuff, the box office every weekend. And like my dad will be like, Oh, just see that movie you enjoyed this weekend made this amount of money at the box office. Like everybody's kind of aware of it. Yeah. Who might not necessarily even dig in for entertainment news. It's, I mean, the, the last six months of quarantine time have been weird for me where I have basically just yeah paying attention to the box. Office. Whereas that was just part of my life. That was part of like my Sunday was looking just, Checking out the box office for the weekend, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, going back to the 90s. From the from Oh, yeah. The, just, that's, uh, that's just uh, what I do, you know? Yeah, like JoeBlow.com or something like that. I mean, that was one of the first blogs I remember reading, and they had every Sunday have the box office on there, and it was just <laughs> part of my routine. So this sequence here. Yeah. Uh, visually really great. Uh almost kind of planet of the apes esque you know yeah yeah uh, when he descends into the city which again and i being that guy but there is nowhere near enough water in the <laughs> in the ice caps yeah. to to make this it just it does not work in even a little bit of sense yeah yeah uh, i was wondering what he was doing with these flares too what was is this supposed to be like illuminating the city so she can see it? I mean, obviously for us as the it's, movie viewer, they have the it, whole thing. It would have to be for viewable. her. Yeah. Because for him, or maybe for him um, to see. Yeah. But, I mean, obviously that deep, it's going to be black. Right. Pitch. You're not going to see anything. Right. Right. So but I, because it's a movie, they're like, well, the audience has got to see, see what's going on here. Yeah. Maybe if they had more ability, they would have you know, using computers, done it in such a way where it is pitch black, but then the flares start to reveal. To reveal it, yeah. Yeah, and it's... I mean, this is pretty great, you view. know? It's a nice... Model. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is obviously rear projection. Yeah. Or front front projection. Yeah, this is a good scene. I like this scene. So basically, it's like, hey, uh, well, if, if there's no dry land, where are you getting all your, 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 your crayons dirt. and shit? And it's like... He just goes down to the the sunken Target store. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, right? <laughs> I read apparently uh, the Pepsi can. Somehow they figured out how to get <laughs> product placement, <laughs> some cross promotion. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I think I read that the uh, city was based on Colorado somewhere. I don't Interesting. Which city? It's it's yeah. meant to be Colorado. Okay. So then that gives us a frame of reference. For if we end up at Mount Everest at the end. Oh, good call. Right? Yeah. That's funny. I didn't even. So that's a ski lift right there, right? Oh, you're totally right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I didn't even think about it yesterday. I think I was just looking at them, like thinking about the shot, the effect shot. That's like haunting, isn't it? That ski lift for some reason. Yeah. Just something about that. I don't know. There's this uh, book that I that I I was gonna say I read, but I listened to it. It's called "The World Without Us," mm. and basically it's just a scientific 
extrapolation of like if all of humanity just blinked out of existence tomorrow, what would happen to everything? Mm-hmm. And sort of just laying out the the process by which the Earth reclaims everything, you know. And it's it's a fascinating listen, but again, it's 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 haunting, you know. Yeah. Uh, when when you when you lay out just how quickly whatever mark we left would just vanish, right? Be consumed, yeah. taken back, like you said, you know, as if we were never here to begin with. And it makes it makes you uh, it puts you in mind of just how insignificant we are in the big picture. Yeah. Anyway, it's more about Waterworld. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's where, like, we both just start staring out windows. Yeah. <laughs> we're, 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 like, we're like Tarantino in that one meme where he's just, like, wandering around the empty house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That's so good. Um, what was I going to say? But they're... Oh, it just it, the Mad Max thing came back to me because they have like grease all over their faces. So it's like fuel is still even for them like a, a commodity, right? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if they like commodity. It's not like they trade it, but. Well, the, and that's why these guys are called smokers, right? More than just the, more than the cigarettes. The idea is that they're the only ones using like diesel. So, Dude, I feel like a friggin' idiot. I did not even put together that they are called the smokers and they're smoking all the time. <laughs> 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 anyway but yes yes it, it could have multiple meanings and that's what i'm gonna go with because it's gonna make me feel better about myself <laughs> yeah, that, i was that, actually thinking about the smoke that was coming out of the back of their that's i mean that's engines. the that's like the in-world reason why yeah 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 um because anybody out in the in in the world you'll see the smoke from a mile away right smokers right? yeah so and they're the bad so you'd that would be an easy way to signal people oh the, the, the smokers are coming they're the bad guys you know right But I am super curious about this choice with the cigarettes. I'd, I'd be, I wonder what that was all about. I mean, it it seems like uh, like uh, something that Kevin Reynolds probably would have. You know, Kevin Reynolds was very. He wanted it to be like a comment, like a commentary on on uh, you know environmentalism, right? Like a, it's an mm-hmm. eco fable. I think he called it. Yeah. And so what better shorthand than, yeah, and these are the bad guys, and we know that they, cause they're just smoking all the time, like piece of shit, you know? It, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I can see where uh, just uh, visually they're greasy, they smoke. Kind of like the pollutants. Yeah, you know, kind of, I don't know, kind of makes sense. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know, it just as they turn her upside down, the little girl that's reminding me. That that was sort of the twist of the movie, the map. They were looking at it wrong. It was upside down. and Now they're actually looking at it correctly on accident, and they don't realize it. <laughs> and they don't even know. Yeah. So Roger Ebert was not kind to this movie. To, really? To... I I read a snippet where he seemed a little... He, what did he say? Like, I'm not unhappy I watched it, but I can't recommend it. <laughs> Which is such a... But did you read the whole thing? Was he a little harsher about it? Yeah, I mean, he gave it two and a half stars. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, he summed it up this way. He says, I'll remember some of the sights in Waterworld for a long time, but I won't necessarily want to see them again. Hmm. Which, I mean, in you know, I guess it's all about how you choose to interpret that. But, yeah. you know, that was kind of me, like, watching it. I was like, well, hey, I had fun. Like, I'm not in a hurry to rewatch it. Granted, that's what I'm doing right now, but... <laughs> Like I don't see myself in the near future being like, let's put on Waterworld, boys. Let's, you know. Yeah. But like, say a couple of years from now, I could see watching it if it's on TV. You know. Yeah, this is sort of like I said. I'd only seen it once before this, but this is sort of cemented where if this is on TV, I'd probably stop on it. Yeah, I I think that's that's fair. By the way, so okay, so that scene where uh, the girls being kidnapped and they have to sort of hide because they're being shot at. And so she can't breathe underwater. And he's like, I'll breathe for you. Yeah. And so they kind of share this kiss underwater and he's giving her oxygen. I, you know, some for some reason, as I was watching it yesterday, it made me feel weird that they were down there kissing while this girl was being yep. dragged away. Mm-hmm. I almost wish they had kept the bullets coming around them. Well, the fact like, that it 
Like it, you can't go up. You have to be down here. Is all I'm saying. Like right, I just, and and it it becomes like a romantic moment. Yes. Which, like, I mean, it is obviously. I get it, but I I think yeah. It it I I totally agree because I had that exact same reaction. Yeah, because they come I need up to and know it's like, that right. they have no choice. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Like, I almost think it would have been better to. Like she's unconscious or something, and he's trying to keep her alive. Right. Underwater. Yeah. CPR underwater or something. Yeah, you know, something like that. Yeah. It's that hilarious is, how she just like annoys the shit out of everybody in the in the. Yeah. <laughs> it's really funny. That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> um. I don't know why that line made me laugh. You're like, you want a cigarette? You're never too young to start. <laughs> <laughs> it all feels like very weed y doesn't he? Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really does. You know what's funny though, Brian, is like at this point, Joss Whedon was not, you know, all caps Joss Whedon. Yeah. Uh, to the to the world at large, uh, and yet, in fact, now that I think about it, my first awareness of him may very well have come from this movie. Oh, really? Yeah, because I remember reading an interview with him around this time this movie came out. Hmm. And about the fact that he'd been a script doctor on it and whatever. And and I only mention this because I remember that when Buffy the Vampire Slayer became a series, I was like, oh, Joss Whedon, okay. Like, I, I had that reaction. Mm. Oh, As interesting. opposed to who's this guy, you know? Right. So that's uh, I don't know that's just uh, like I'm I'm sparking some some long subsumed memory there. Yeah, I think for me it might have been Buffy. Okay. And yeah, then, I mean that was obviously I think where the majority of yeah, people became aware of obvious, him, but yeah. I definitely knew who he was before Buffy. Right. So and what, ha- what, he did X Men, right? Like a punch up on X Men. Yeah, what what year like, was that? that I was mean, 2000. was that post Buffy? That was post Buffy. Okay. Because Buffy started By the way, in 97. Yeah, sorry, good. Uh, oh, okay, okay. She's like, I was going to say, we, when we, we got to this point now, in the movie... Kevin and Costner? Oh, I'm sorry? What? Uh, just the, the look on it. She's like, shall we have sex now, Kevin Costner? Yeah, well, actually, that's what I was just gonna about to get to. I was going to yeah. say, it was reminding me of uh, Natalie Portman in uh, Attack of the Clones and how they just keep trying to find ways to have her in less clothing. <laughs> you know, where it's like... <laughs> You know, oh, a monster. Oh, no, a monster ripped off half her shirt, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> and then when I was watching this, I actually watched it over. I started it yesterday and I had to finish it this morning. And so when we cut to that shot of her, I was like, wait, where did her clothes go? <laughs> like, you could keep somehow piece by piece falling away. By the end, it's just like a fur bikini. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, going back to what we were just talking about, this feels like. I don't know. Maybe you should figure out how to make your boat go. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, the 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 relationship doesn't make sense to me, except as just a well. That's what we do in these movies. Yeah, they have to like consummate at some point, and so this is the moment where we have some free time. Yeah, I mean, I like his line, you know, where she was like, "Why didn't you take me in that moment?" He's like, "Well, I could tell you didn't want me to." I mean, that's that's good. That's a good character moment. Yeah. So then you would could understand then how she her perception of him would, you know, I don't know. But <laughs> it just feels, do we need that? Like, it just feels kind of, yeah. let's go. <laughs> let's hurry. We got, we got uh, shit to do here. We got a child to save. <laughs> she might be addicted to cigarettes by the time we get there. <laughs> right, right. That actually would be hilarious. <laughs> if they're like, are you okay? She's like, yeah, no, totally fine. Uh, let's get out of here. And then she just lights a cigarette. You know, like she's picked up one little trait from them, her time with them. You know, as I'm watching this, Brian, I'm realizing I would not be happy on Waterworld. No. It's uh, it's no. not a place I'd want to live. I've decided that uh, during the course yeah. of the conversation. I think it's comfortable to uh, say I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, getting ahead of it, it's funny at the end when they do find land, and he's like, it just feels weird here. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's called land sickness. Land sickness, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which made me realize, like, oh, yeah, they're like, 
their whole lives are just bobbing up and down. That'd be it's, so weird. It's just the the ground moving under your feet constantly. It would drive me insane. Yeah. I'm I'm not a water person in general. I don't I don't like uh, going out on boats and things like that. Yeah, you know I I do actually like being on boats, but uh, I'm not a huge swimmer. Like I've learned yeah. how to swim enough that I can swim, but I'm not a super strong swimmer. So I'm not a guy that is always feeling this desire to just jump in the ocean or anything. I, I'm I'm not a Kevin Costner carrying me on his back swimmer yet. <laughs> right, right. Like I, I mean, I like getting my feet wet. I love the ocean. I like going to the beach and I love standing in the water and have waves kind of crash on me a little bit. But like, I'm not like a let's see how far I can go kind of guy. It's you know, like for me, uh, uh, you know, you know how much I really liked uh, All Is Lost, that Robert Redford movie. Oh, that was great. Yeah, right. And, and but that like sums up my absolute mortification. Like my right. my immediately visualizing the worst case scenario is just you're stuck in the middle of the water, and just that's it, man. You're you're done. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So this guy, when I was watching this, I was imagining. I wish they had added a sound of the, you know, to this boat just to make it even more sillier. <laughs> it's a, oh, hello. <laughs> it's just so funny this guy shows up in this like Mr. Fantabulous Zip he, Zoop Zip. He is like a Disney character, isn't he? Yeah. It's like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Yeah. And then I think it goes to this wide shot at some point. It just thought it'd be hilarious. I think maybe it's at the end when he comes to the rescue again. I just wanted to hear <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to add to the <laughs> That yeah, actor, by the way, that is uh, Michael Jeter. Who Yeah, I knew I recognized him. I had to l- look him up. He yeah he he passed away uh, I want to say like two thousand three something like that. Oh, okay. He's in he's in the Green Mile. Have you seen the Green Mile? Yes. Yeah. yeah. He's like the guy with the mouse, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, Who's that guy on the right? By the way, he looks familiar. The, like the 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 marshal or whatever. Yeah. Like the guy who was like running the. The the yeah the, he the, just. The, the, I wouldn't be surprised to learn he was in Prince of Thieves or something, and I just recognize his face. Or the the guy with the beard. With the beard. Yeah. He looks familiar to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna look that up. <laughs> See, suddenly now everyone's like, Psh, "Whatever, screw the girl," and Costner's like, "No, we gotta get her." Right, right, right. Like the, I, that turn struck me again as I like. Obviously, you get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it struck me as a little little abrupt. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, I guess, the, the tattoo on her back. Like you said, I don't think it's revealed, right? But they end up at uh, Mount Everest. But that is, the, the, the lettering on her back are the exact coordinates of Mount Everest. Hmm. I actually didn't know that. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. See, but the backstory yeah. confuses me, and I don't think they explain it. Because because Helen found her in the basket, right? But like, why? How did how did that happen? Where did she come from? Yeah, yeah. Like, how does she end up in the basket? Yeah, that's a good. I I didn't even think about it. Yeah, it just looks like a guy who's probably in a lot of. He's probably in Braveheart. He had to be. <laughs> just look at that face. I'm, I'm willing to bet he was in Braveheart. Yeah. That's a cool shot. Let's see. It was not in Braveheart. Yeah. Sorry, Brian, you lose this round. But I yeah. think uh, but everyone who watched Braveheart lost this round because he would have been perfect. <laughs> this is we got to point this out, by the way, Joe Hazelwood. That yeah, so that's the captain of the Exxon Valdez. This is where we find out that the, their ship is the Exxon Valdez, and that is a joke that has absolutely no currency past like two thousand. If you're being generous, yeah, yeah. So, I, but but they look to him like, oh, Saint Joe. Yeah, <laughs> you know? that's pretty funny. And yeah, he he crashed the the oil tanker. That, like you said, the Exxon Valdez, which was a huge for people who don't know, humongous oil spill, and it was an enormous news story and it caused a lot of damage just to the environment and to animals and it was really it was a disaster 
So it just makes you wonder when it was so recent. What was that? No, it was 80, 1989 when that yep. happened. Yep. And this comes out in 1995. I mean, can you imagine being that guy? <laughs> you know? That's and just funny. like, oh, there, now, I'm, now I'm uh, in Waterworld as someone that the villains worship in the future. <laughs> For, like forever. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he's known as. Yeah. That's a good point. I just, I just. I mean, you know, it's it's up. silly, but it's it's kind of it's kind of clever, right? I mean, they're they're on the Exxon Valdez. I no, thought, it's maybe a good it, gag. It's, I maybe at the time it might have been a little eye rolly or something, but like as someone who remembers it as something a little bit in the past, I'm like that's that's where they got all the oil. That's where they it kind of makes sense. No, no, I, I think I think it absolutely works. Yeah, as as just a gag. Yeah, yeah. I I just I looked up Joe Hazelwood on on Wikipedia just now, Brian. Yeah. Uh, in 2009, Hazelwood offered a heartfelt apology to the people of Alaska, but suggested he had been wrongly blamed for the disaster. Uh, which I'd be curious sound, to read does, more about it because I don't know sound how like a it heartfelt happened. apology, Brian. Is all I'm saying. Well, yeah, 20 years later, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Hey, guys, I, mean, he, I, just, I, just, I just want to apologize for <laughs> for, for that whole <laughs> thing. Is is a bad bad time for everybody? Yeah. That's my Joe Hazel impression. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to add that to my repertoire. <laughs> right. <laughs> and mine's going to be more like Daffy Duck. Like, it was, a, it was a disaster, but I apologize. I like yours better, actually. Why not? Why not? See, <laughs> we this can have right our own impersonations okay, so, of him. So this scene, yes. he's their religious leader. He's throwing them spam, and they're fighting. You like, remind me of like, Captain Hook in Hook. Yes. You know, all these, like, yeah, underlings on a boat running up to him, and he's speaking from this balcony. Yeah, sorry, Steph, I, I, please continue. Yeah, no, so, but this is my point. Like, I think I think it's funny, mm-hmm. but I think it shouldn't be funny. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Because he's up there, he's, he like, making seem... jokes, and I don't know, you know? You're totally right. You're totally right. I, I agree. He should be someone when he he has a public face, and we should see that face crack. Yeah, in front of his people, maybe thanks to Costner intervening here. Yes, that might have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is funny though, because now that I'm thinking of Hook, I mean it's sort of similar, right? Where he is this villain, but he is a little insecure and kind of mm-hmm. wisecracky. Maybe that's yep. a very '90s thing. <laughs> We wanted our villains to have feet of clay. Yeah. This, you know, I I talked earlier about the idea of this is a movie that is just you know ch- chain linked to this era, and what I mean by that is I feel like the '90s was perhaps the 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 only time where a studio would be willing to go full high class budget for a, a, a what is not a pre-sold uh, 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 story, you know? Mm-hmm. The idea of, like, science fiction being given all the trimmings, but it's not something that is, you know, a franchise title or something. Mm-hmm. And if anything, Waterworld is the last gasp of being able to do that. Yeah. Right? Because when you think With this about much it, resource being given to it, yeah. Yeah, you know, because because it was... And and not to say this wasn't meant to be a franchise, but it was. I mean, there was toys and there was a whole thing, but but it wasn't a sequel. It was just, hey, we're gonna really give what is kind of an exploitation story. We're gonna really give it a a, a, a spit and polish. Arguably, yeah. And it, th- yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Well, I was gonna. No, no, no. You you first. Just, I mean, the fact that it only did okay and it it was uh, it, sort of overcome by by the budget talk is what led to studios no longer being willing to to invest in stuff like this anymore yep yep i did have that a similar sort of thought where man the 90s might have been the last decade where yeah a movie like this original idea like independence day even you know i mean we all know it now and then they tried to make a sequel these years later but that was just original 
you know, and now it's kind of sad. I, and it, I was going to say, I love the Spider-Man movies, but it is funny when you think about, well, they had the Sam Raimi Spider-Man and they're like, okay, well, uh, do it again, do it again. They're like, all right, Andrew Garfield. Oh, that didn't work either. Again, again, yep. again, you know, yep. but it's like they just keep taking the same things that they know work and, and, and going with that. Whereas, yeah, you just, it was just filled with all these original ideas that are classics now. And, and 90s, even if they're they not just... classics, they're, like I'm, I'm just thinking, like, uh, in the just before this, like a year before this, you had Stargate, which I don't think is a great movie, but I mean they threw some money behind that. Yes, yeah. You had uh, a year after this was Dragonheart, which is I don't think it's particularly good, but again, it was a big budget thing. Mm-hmm. Independence mm-hmm. Day, like you said, the the Matrix arguably is like kind of the last time. Yeah, you know? yeah. And here we are waiting for our next Matrix sequel because yeah. no one's going to find the next Matrix. They just got to go with the thing that worked. But the 90s allowed the Matrix to exist. That's, I mean, it's kind of, you know, we're talking about the Matrix. Another in the in the vein of the Matrix is Dark City. Yeah. Which is a movie I absolutely adore. Yeah. And you look at that, and I, I just happened to rewatch it not, not that long ago. Uh, you just would not see that today. No, uh, with that not on scale. the scale. Like it would be like a Netflix movie or something, exactly. right? Yeah, it was, it was, I mean they they and that movie. I mean they took a bath on it, so <laughs> there's a reason we didn't see that anymore. But, sure, sure. But I mean the the but willingness. Sometimes they land. Sometimes they land. Um, to just to kind of swing for the fences. I, I appreciated that. Yeah, yeah. I wish I wish we'd get more of this stuff, but you you don't have to spend all this money on it, you know, but. I, I want it all. I want the franchise stuff. I want the original stuff. I want the dramas. <laughs> Won't you it's, give the dramas to me? It, it yeah. <laughs> it's um, I think these days the conversation becomes more about if you have something really exceptional made for a very low budget. Mm-hmm. Right. So your Get Out and your uh, Yep. Quiet Place. Yep. And it's like, oh, they didn't spend anything, but it, you know, big budget. Who gives a shit? You know what? That's you're 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 restoring my hope a little bit. <laughs> the, the, the get out in a quiet place did become these sort of phenomenons, and they were original. And uh, I mean, I know they were low budget, but they didn't feel like they were lacking. I mean, they yeah. got to do what they wanted to do, and yeah. Now all of this was like a set, I think. Okay. That feels like that could be some sort of, not a pier, but yeah, yeah, something you could dress and. And I mean, it looks like it's composited for some of those shots. Yeah, with the yeah, from his balcony, it looks yeah, like definitely. It especially. I remember reading like among one of these scenes, you know, they're getting things set up, and then there's like a delay, and uh, one of the extras goes up to Costner and asks for an autograph, and at that point, he's just like. Ugh. You have to politely say no, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and just reading about how, like, basically he, like, looks over at just, like, all the other extras. Right. And he's like, I, if it's good, it would set a really bad precedent. Like, uh, you know, like, suddenly your afternoon is done, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man, ballsy. <laughs> that's how I was that. thinking that. I was like, you would think that's something they tell extras, like, don't do this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think about it now, too, where now that we have uh, cameras, you know, on our phones. Yeah. I mean, even when I started working on some sets, like I didn't I I had this really crappy like Nokia or whatever, you know, so I do have a couple pictures. I worked on this movie where they had a built a whole sort of wing of a casino and it was amazing. And I just lament that I didn't have this high quality camera to take a couple pictures. But I had these incredible like eight bit looking, you know, or 16 bit looking (laughs) pictures. Because that's all. So all that I was had, just but... my luck. Uh, bu- 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 lucky you, lucky What's you. It? Which is one? Yeah, fr- the Eric Bana one, right? Yep, Robert okay. Duvall. Just my luck is that's the Lindsay Lohan movie. Lindsay Lohan. You one. You didn't work on that though. Uh, I tied to it in some ways. Okay. I, I, uh, Justin You're... Bartha auditioned for that. Okay. And uh, I had to drive him to his audition. He auditioned. And for I introduced the, him the to the Chris... band Muse. <laughs> I have a lot of memories of. <laughs> Just That's me right. and Justin Bartha in my car. So did he audition for the Chris Pine role? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yep. Chris Pine, right? Who knew? <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> and they she uh, she was not very nice to him on that film. I heard that. Yeah, and you yep. know that to me that's like one of those that's like a life lesson, right? Be careful who you yep. who you uh, who you step on on your way up. It's true because you know as she was on her way down, if they had forged some sort of nice friendship or bond or working relationship, I mean, he might have looked out for her, you know. And and by all accounts, you hear that Chris Pine's just a really down to earth guy. Yeah. So yeah. Um, pardon my language here, but uh, the line that he says here, "You're a total freaking retard." Oh yeah, that sticks Very out, 90s. doesn't it? That, 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 yeah, that, I was like, that does feel like something I probably sadly would have said as a kid. Oh yeah. And then now you watch it and you're like, oh wow. Yeah it it's, I suppose it's just evidence of, uh, culturally sort of growth, that that mm-hmm. does stick out. I mean, it it should. It's an ugly word, right? It's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. But it just, I'm like, oh, that feels like something. Yeah, that that feels like 25 years ago that that would have been like a laugh line or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. Do you hear what Dennis Hopper said? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, unfortunately, I mean, when we were growing up in the 90s, a lot of this stuff was said very commonly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm going to embarrass myself. I probably did it a lot, too, you know? Oh, I'm sure I did. Yeah. Without without giving too much thought to it, you know? Yeah. But that's good. We grow. We we are better people, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's okay just end it that? here. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we I'm just proud of in, us. Invalidated our progress by saying <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I like this here where the thing falls down and then for a second you're like, oh poor guy. And then they have him say, oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know it kind of disturbed me at first, but I was like, yeah, he, he's, he's in hell. Like, that, he's living doesn't with it feel like they, and... they put that line in there specifically to make sure you don't feel bad about Costner just like nuking him? I had that very thought. Yeah. <laughs> and this this is just spectacle that we will not get ever again. Yeah. I mean, the danger and the... I mean, the limitations, right? But they're, this is incredible. Like him j- leaping through these things and the boat half on fire and all of it's practical. And it's just so, I mean, you just can't help but be wow. Like, look at that. Those yeah. jet skis flying out of those holes with the explosions behind them. Like, it's just, you got to respect it. What's What's funny is I can totally imagine watching this movie initially and being like, oh my gosh, the end, it's just like all these explosions and stuff, it's just too much, right? Yes. And you watch it now, you're like, oh, look how like small scale this is. Yeah. Th- this is but, like but get I, out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I wish people could see what I was looking at as you said that, because it's just like a man on a chain swinging with a machine gun and a car exploding. Like, yeah, it's just like that, you know, small movie, get out. <laughs> it's, it's like that um, racism movie, you know? Well, what I was going to say was, I what I thought you were going to say in the 90s i would have watched this like yeah 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 no yeah it was cool yeah but like now i have a different appreciation oh, for absolutely. it because i know this was a lot of work and they All wouldn't do the this work. anymore yeah this is so impressive this whole sequence with this plane all the ways he sort of stops it and rips it you know puts the anchor on it and rips the legs off and then it crashes it's just so cool it is it's you can you can This is by the way, sorry, that that does that feel not very heroic? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> or it's like this villain points a gun at him and it clicks, misfires, and then Costner, almost like a Schwarzenegger or like a in Stallone and Cobra, just turns around with a shotgun and just blam <laughs> like blows him away. Like the, it feels like a lot of times you go through these strains or these efforts to find a way to yep. give the hero like he has to extend his hand to save the person anyway, but in this one they're like, no. He just turns around and blows him away. It's that does that does feel like a little artifact of of action movies from days of yore, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, of like just the unapologetically killing the villain without thinking twice. This yes. look at this this shot this right is here. Awesome. There the look at that. That is Kevin Costner. Yeah. On the zip line. And it was such a stage shot that we like started the camera on the plane, moving, panned up. Like there's just so many components at play. I mean, amazing. It's amazing. He, you have to imagine he had some fun doing some of these stunts. Oh, dude, sign me up. <laughs> right. I would love to try this. 
That's great. I love this. Is just so invent. I mean, this feels Indiana Jonesy. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> yeah, this is good stuff. Yeah, I, Kevin Costner was asked about the movie a couple of years ago, and I like what he, um, what he said about it. Right? He says, "I'm not sure you know how hard people work on films." Uh, I'm mm. not sure you know how beloved the movie is around the world. Being hard on a film is really easy if you don't know the underbelly of what went into it. When you do know mm. the forensics of a movie, and Brian, this sort of speaks to what you were saying, the participation and discussions of, other, of and decisions of others that one has to stand in front of, you can't help but see it differently. Mm. I know that people might think of Waterworld as a low point for me. It wasn't. It could have had a better, more obvious outcome. The thing I know is that I never had to stand taller for a movie when most were going the other way. The movie, with all its imperfections, was a joy for me, a joy to look back upon and to have participated in. I love that. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, I love that. I'm glad. I'm glad he sees it that way. And, he should and, be proud of this. And the thing is, the reason I say like he doesn't have to bullshit about it is because, again, you see the effort on the screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, you know, I keep coming back to that. Like it's it. It's as he says, like yeah, they're imperfections or whatever. But I mean, it's it is a work. It is representative of a, of a vision. I was going to say a singular vision, but <laughs> right. a couple of visions. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's there, you know. Yeah. Boom. So yeah, this this is again where they they cut to the uh, fantabulous. Yeah. Right. <laughs> zoop zoop zoop. Zoop. I want. <laughs> <laughs> after all this seriousness <laughs> so i had forgotten that there i guess it's almost like a rule when you kill the bad guy there has to be the he comes back for a split the, second the you double death dead, but he's not but uh i don't know like the second time didn't play as well for me i i kind of liked that he was hanging by the rope and oh well there it is exxon valdez um We're, but yeah i kind of liked it uh you know, they think they're getting away, but he jumps under the rope and she gets to help contribute and and it all kind of worked. Um, I, <laughs> and, but then well, the, this, them all kind of all, crashing don't, into don't each other felt sitting, silly to me. Right at, don't ever sitting right at the edge, right? Like, obviously. The, right. <laughs> right. I, no, I, I, Brian, I think the problem is the, 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 the trope of the falling villain only works if the falling villain visibly go splat no oh, i agree i agree i mean they could have had something below him to oh yeah he did yeah but like the see I, I, maybe this is okay i don't know the first time i watched this i felt like it like them coming together almost remind me of like biff and his goons like crashing into a manure truck or something <laughs> yeah, right. Shit. you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah that's i almost want them to do that here <laughs> watch like this when they see each other <laughs> <laughs> right I and then the explosion no, is like kind of comically ridiculous like it almost feels comedic it it does seem a little bit tonally out of step with what we've seen thus far yeah right yeah but i mean whatever minor now, complaint now that is not a bungee cord i thought that too i was like dude he's gonna break his back yeah <laughs> i was like does it does regular rope bounce like that well, then I, I did think, oh, was it bungee cord? Because I didn't realize it was. Oh, it is bungee that's cord? That's No, no. Well, that's what I'm saying. I just, my, my mind uh, apologized for the movie. Oh, and God. It, <laughs> oh, I suppose it was bungee cord and I didn't know. Sorry, movie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, see, all, all of this stuff becomes very noticeably uh, uh, composite yeah, yeah. And and uh, understandable obviously, but like it it felt like visually jarring given how grounded no pun intended everything felt before that. To- I totally agree. Totally agree. I'd say for the most part because all of those effects look practical and real. I mean, it doesn't look of a certain age. Right. But yes, when you do see <laughs> the limitations of the things they had to do, you're like, oh, right, yeah, this is old. Like nowadays, that would absolutely be CGI. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's kind of the thing. I mean, if if you were to make a movie like this today, it would invariably be, I was going to say cheaper, but no, it, it would it would still be expensive. But 
um, it would be easier to make. It would be less like risk to life and limb, probably. Mm-hmm. But it would be less impressive. I kind of agree. Right. I don't kind of agree. I agree. I I, I mean, I was thinking that like whatever last great action film I saw in the theater recently, hmm. not even great. Let's just say good, good action film. Whatever it was, I don't even know what it was, but I know it probably wasn't as impressive as this movie. <laughs> Just by it just couldn't be because it it's not the same. It reminds me. I mean, like it, it, we may have talked about this in the early part of the year. I mean, when we watched Bad Boys for Life, um, yeah. What struck what, what struck me? I, I believe it. That you you mentioned this too. I mean, it just how like what a throwback it felt like. Yep. Yep. I got there. I do want to say, by the way. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to sound like some sort of snob and completely dismiss movies these days because it's right. like you can still absolutely make a fantastic action movie. But I think it all has to do with how invested your viewer is in the stakes of it all. Yeah. I mean, just right? to, uh, to, to your point, Brian, like like you look at Avengers Endgame. Yeah. And I I adore that movie. Right. But th- I don't know. Your your brain makes certain concessions when watching that movie where you say, well, obviously none of it is real and you just accept it and you accept it within the world that it creates and that's fine. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not saying this is better than Avengers Endgame, but the, the visuals, what they achieve with what they have on hand is what makes you appreciate more everything they were able to accomplish given the very real limitations, not only of, of the time, but just of physics Yes, well, I was just going to say, I think an Avengers works so well because we care about what they're uh, setting out to achieve, yeah, right? Yeah, right? But I do remember, you're, you're, I'm having a flashback to Guardians of the Galaxy 2, hmm. and I remember that there was a scene where like the ship was crashing through all these things, but it just felt like absolutely no yeah. consequence, yep. and no physics, and no damage, and no whatever. And I remember thinking like, well, all right, this is just kind of loud, and I'm looking forward to getting back to the characters. right. Totally. So, so these skeletons are they Enola's parents? I yeah, I wasn't clear on that. Like, but, I, but we see that they have been making maps that are similar to the tattoo on her back. So we assume those are the people that put it on her. See, like I'm, I find this ending confusing because it's like, obviously there were people there. Yeah, maybe it was just her parents, but in, everything is fine here. So why did they feel the need to to send her off? Yeah. Right. And 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 if to, this to is tell? well, yeah. If if this is uh, you know, Mount Everest, how long did she float <laughs> before she ended up uh, like near Colorado? Yeah. A lot of questions. Well, maybe a sequel would have answered them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But we're never gonna get Waterworlder. No. No. I mean, do you think this is something they would ever consider remaking? I I can't imagine. I mean, it, there oh, is yeah. such a <laughs> right. There is such a residual like uh, bad will, you know. Yeah. Uh, I th- I think Universal is happy that they sort of got out the other side of it with their with their shirt still on their back, you know. Hmm. The fact that they're still cashing out on the stunt show. that It's like gravy at this point, you know? Yeah. You take the win. Yeah. I remember this there was is... a whole line of action yeah. figures. Oh, really? From I believe it was Kenner. Yeah, and it was, it was pretty cool, actually. Like They had like these uh, water features where you would like squeeze a bellows and stuff would come out. It was kind of neat. Uh, huh? But, I mean, that stuff was remaindered like inside of six months. Yeah, oh, I... I can't even imagine. You know, I remember there was a comic book series a couple years after this uh, from Acclaim Comics, and uh, Kevin Costner did not give his likeness rights, so they just made hmm. the Mariner look like kind of a generic dude. Why not? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I mean, if there's some sort of fandom continuing, and you get a couple bucks in your pocket, yeah, right. Now there is you were discussing the alternate edits. There, there's uh, what's called the Ulysses cut, right? And that is because uh, in that version, when they arrive at dry land, uh, Helen uh, Jean Triplehorn gives 
Mariner the name Ulysses because he doesn't have it. I thought you were going to say that he gives she gives him the book Ulysses and he doesn't read it either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because he's sorry, just okay. like what, us. Did, yeah, yeah, just. Like, yeah. <laughs> so wait, what, what, well, I'm sorry. What? So, where did so, she get that name? So Ulysses is is uh, the the alternate name for Odysseus. Oh, okay. So Odysseus w- wanders the seas, mm-hmm. just like the Mariner. Very nice, very nice. So wait, why would they cut that here? I mean, was it part of a bigger sort of thing that was removed, or they just took that I, detail? I out? mean. It here's my guess, and I haven't seen the extended version. But if it was more baked into the movie, the idea that he doesn't know who he is mm. and he has no name and identity, like if that was something that weighed down the entire story, then that that could serve as sort of a culmination, right? Right. Yeah, but we never sense. get the sense that he is in any way, you know, not comfortable in his own skin. Yeah, he's just. This is. I'm the Mariner. This is my world. This is what I do. Like that's uh, throughout. Down to him leaving here. I mean, I was a little yeah. surprised actually that he left. Yeah, I, you recognize the the necessity of that from like a franchise perspective. Mm-hmm. But certainly the idea that like he's found this family. But I mean, then again, it's like. Now he knows where this place is. And he can come back whenever he wants. So it's also that. I see. I even thought that he might say that to her. I thought that was really sweet, actually. When she's like, "Why'd you come for me?" and he's like, "I like you." Yeah, I thought I that did. was really nice. I, I did like that. It was a nice moment. But then he he could have said like, "I'll be back." Like when? Right. I don't know, but I'll be back S- or someday. something. But yeah. yeah, this shot is very impressive too. By the way, thinking of a helicopter, where you start on them right there on that cliff and how yeah. it slowly edges up. I mean, looking down, right, on this sort of cliffside. Well, and, and not just that, having to make sure that the entire coastline is clear. Yeah, no, yeah. No civilian traffic, anything like that. I mean, the, you have the, that family from the opening of uh, Lost World. Yeah, exactly. God like, damn oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at that. That is. Yeah, it's beautiful. And Dean Semler, so I guess also. DP, that oh, sorry, God. yeah, yeah. Dean Semler being the DP suddenly it makes sense because he's he's very impressive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This movie is. Well, I was just going to point out. I guess something else that was cut that Kevin Reynolds says he misses a lot was the camera panned up and it revealed that the uh, characters were standing by a sign that said Mount Everest, like it was right. clear. Which I I would have to see it. Like I don't know what that looks like. Yeah, actually, I knowing it exists, I'm, I'll get around to it. I'm sure someday I'll watch that longer cut because I am a little curious. This is this is I don't know, Brian. This is a fascinating, uh, just artifact of a film. You know? Yeah. It, it's, it's sort of it exists right in this middle ground, uh, between brilliant and forgettable. <laughs> yeah. It's like right in yeah. the middle. This Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's it's so true though. I, I, yeah. I mean we, we said it at the top, right? It, they don't make movies like this anymore. And and obviously the, the reality is well the the reason they don't is because it's just f- more financially feasible to to make your sequels and your you know uh, the uh, your 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 remakes. Mm-hmm. And to use a lot of CGI, so all of that stuff—that's that's that's those are the tools available now. So of course you should use them. And so I'm not saying one era is better or worse. What I am saying is what that does allow us to do is look back at movies from this time mm-hmm. and appreciate them for giving us something that we won't get anymore. Hmm. I very well put. Yeah i I would say it is imperfect. However, if you are the type of person who can still watch something like that because you enjoy feasts for your eyeballs, <laughs> I I think this is a worthy feast for your eyeballs. Well, there we go. I, I actually think that's a good place to wrap up this discussion. Yeah, well, I got to say, I mean, I told a, a couple people that I was watching this for the podcast and I, everyone was like, why? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got to tell you, I... I enjoyed revisiting it, and I certainly enjoyed talking through it with you. I, so. you know, this was 
uh, an absolute lark. I want to I, I want to clarify that they, I didn't come at this with some deep seated sense of fandom. It was more like, hey, this movie's twenty five years old, and you know they talked about it a lot back then. You want to just like watch it and see what we can do? That was mm-hmm. it. Was like me rolling the dice. Yeah, and I, I I shouldn't have doubted that we could end up uh, filling the time and having a really engaging conversation. <laughs> well, I, I got to say, whenever we we discuss doing commentaries, and I see a movie's over two hours, I I go, Ugh. <laughs> I don't know how this is gonna go, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, this was I I love this. If, if love this was this two and a half, it would have been a hard pass. So two fifteen, we. Get like- <laughs> That's that's pretty much the line at this point. Yeah, as as people know, I mean, uh, occasionally, we, I think I think the longest we've done is is the Dark Knight. I think. Oh, that that feels right. Yeah, or maybe Dark Knight Rises isn't that even longer? Well, we haven't done that yet, but oh, we haven't. Not yet. It's coming. Holy cow! Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Although, although Brian, one day, uh, and this day may never come, but I will ask you to do the Godfather with me. I, you know what, honestly, knowing how much you know about that movie and what, like, a student of that film you are, I would love, I would like to listen to that. So I'm very happy to be a part <laughs> that, of that. That, that is, is on my, like, uh, you know, that's, that's on the high shelf. We'll get, we'll get there one day. Okay. But our, our next commentary track, Brian, this is, this is one of our mutual favorites. It's Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would go so far as to say that's a top five for me. There you go. So um, I adore that movie. And and by the way, we we were talking about doing it a year ago, and I reread the shooting draft of the script and like made notes oh, and like nice. really dug in. And then when we didn't do it, and you were like, "Well, we'll do it next year," I was like, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> and now I cannot believe we are approaching "quote unquote" next year. So I'm I'm very prepared and very excited to do that. Well, that that's a coming uh, right in time for Thanksgiving. Yep. Which, yep. uh, thank, thank goodness, Thanksgiving is almost here. I don't know what Thanksgiving will look like this year, but I know we will be looking <laughs> at a plane, train, and an automobile. So that's that's on the way. Yep. Uh, uh, we, of course, have our next regular show coming, where we'll be talking about lots of uh, all the latest news that are coming out. And I do want to point out now, uh, while, while uh, it is still fresh, uh, uh, rest in peace, Alex Trebek. We will miss you. Yeah. Oh, so much sad news. Just all at once this year and just seeing that it just yeah really i'm glad i'm glad you said something just to kind of mark that because i i was really sad seeing that news it it's it's sad obviously not least because he has been just you know a, a, a guest in so many of our homes going back to when we were kids uh but the courage with which he faced mm. one of the most awful diagnoses one can imagine um he lived his life as an example right up to the end. Mm-hmm. I think, I think that is something remarkable, you know, and, and, and it is an example that, that, uh, I think anybody can, can learn from. Yeah. And I, I mentioned to Zachy before we started that I, like you said, I didn't read it. I listened to it, but his, uh, recent memoir, it's called the answer is dot, dot, dot reflections on my life. Huh. And, uh, I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, Jeopardy is kind of woven in and out of my life. And even in the pandemic recently, it's something that was really kind of special to me for a while. And so just with that, and then coupled with listening to this book and sort of spending time with him, I just, or or, that's what I was telling Zachy is like, I actually felt like I kind of spent time with him this year. And so just seems like a really good guy. And, uh, yeah, I think it's worth people's time if they want to check that out. Uh, With that, I'm going to ask you once again, everybody listening, if you like what we're doing, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Leave a star rating. Every little bit helps. Uh, If you have any questions or comments for us, you can email us at moviefilmpodcast at gmail.com or hit like on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash moviefilmpodcast, and message us there. Uh, I'm going to put a pin in this discussion, but we'll come back here uh, next week with our next regular show. And on behalf of my partner, Brian Hall, my name is Zachy Hassan. This has been a movie film commentary track. Thank you, everybody, for listening.
Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BDW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. David's Bridal, where brides and bridesmaids get fabulously dressed. We let our friends pick out what we wear. Show off our dance moves. Obsess over every little detail. Hold your hand through it all. Smile bravely when it's time to let go. Make your dreams come true. The things we do for love. Only at David's Bridal. 